Friday morning and you're welcome along to OTB AM this Friday. We have a jam-packed show for you. We're going to get you all those details in just a few minutes. But we are joined in the studio, as they've been uh, self-described in the last couple of moments before we came on air, a star and a millennial. Morning, lads. Which one's which? Snowflakes. I mean, snow, snowflakes. Snowflakes either side of me. We also had a rendition of The Town I Love So Well from one of you just a few minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, if anybody wants to take ownership of that. Me. Gladly. <laughs> gladly. He gives a repeat rendition, Kenny. I think they should be uh, they should be rolled out in the school curriculum. I reckon there's about half a dozen songs. I think. Oh really? Yeah. Oh yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Should be first first thing you do when you step inside school. First thing you should be taught. I think it, it was an education for me just a moment ago when you sang that song, and it, I, I had no idea of the lyrics. And I thought to myself, you know, us people are really ruining the world. That uh, young people have completely destroyed the society we live in because we don't understand songs like that. But I would be delighted if you gave us another rendition. A traditional bit, traditional folk music. Think, a blast. Agent, a blast. Yeah. Oh God, no. It's, oh, God, it's no. pretty oh. maudlin, isn't it? That's the. I mean, are you into maudlin songs? Yeah, I don't, oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah, full. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I have no problem with it. No problem with that. Yeah. But, uh, bit of think, misery. Think. Bit of misery. <laughs> <laughs> Make you feel better about life. Offload a bit of misery onto other people. Yeah, just pull them down to my level. <laughs> Kenny, you're very welcome. We didn't welcome you to the studio. Kenny Cunningham. Good morning to you. And Owen, welcome back from your holidays, belatedly. Thank you very much. You went on holidays. Yeah, I just noticed a little colour there. Just. Yeah, I stepped outside in 30 degree heat for four seconds, and yeah, here I am. Uh, Where were you? Where, bit, he didn't even go to Hamburg, Kenny. That's the, oh, that's yeah, yeah. I just ashamed him. Ashamed really, him like, last yeah. time. Where'd you, where, where was I'm it? not allowed back in Hamburg. Miami. Anymore. Miami now, was it? Where, I, was in, I, wasn't, I was in the States, but I wasn't. Ah. I, I, like, me in Miami, I mean, like four seconds went <laughs> dead. You know, yeah, yeah. It's hip hop weekend. Hip hop weekend. Boom, boom. Back in the car. You're still not telling us where you were. You're still not telling us where you were. I was in New York. It's all the States. It's a big place. Like, yeah. The Western Hemisphere. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was, that was yeah, I was in the United States of America. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what was going on there? On that? He was at a hip hop festival. Yeah. I, think what we I, was I, I, I was in Boston, Chicago, and New York for a while. Yeah. Oh, nice, yeah, nice. nice. Have you ever been? Motorboy, boy, Harley Davidson to the... No. Oh, no, not no. Uh, the Honda 50, Honda 50. Have you ever been? Uh, no, I haven't really travelled this. I haven't travelled the states. Been to New York once, a la. Uh, the Orl Orland team, oh, which yeah. we, yeah, every couple of years we used to head over there for a bit of. Oh, really? Yeah, a bit of downtime. Bit of team, bit of team bonding, you know, how it goes on. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, I think you'd like it. I think you'd be suited to the American way. No, we had a night. We went on that tour of the, um, uh, the river in New York, got on for about 20 minutes and thought, Hudson. Oh, like, yeah, that's, that's the one that said, oh, let's get out. This is boring. But, uh, really? Couldn't get off it. Yeah, yeah we committed ourselves to that. <laughs> <laughs> to that whole thing about well, four hours. Went out, Devastating. You went out to the Statue of Liberty. Or, did you? Possibly. Yeah. Po possibly. Could have remember seeing the Statue no, of Liberty. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a non drinker. What, uh, what does one of those bonding trips involve? Like, is it a sort of generally just a tour of drinking establishments? Well, in generally, my first trips on the whole squad was coming together. Mick had come in, brought a lot of new faces. Yeah. It was that kind of summer tour. So. Yeah, no, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, oh, here we go, you know, male bond or whatever, but a bit of a cliche. But there was value too, just bringing everybody together over a couple of weeks, period, of year, just spending a bit of time in each other's company mm. in particular, getting to know each other and just pulling the whole squad together. So there was kind of, there was value to it. Uh, Noel was on, remember the four ship? Noel was on the four ship, one or two. Noel in particular had a few good connections. In that. <laughs> Wasn't there the was that the, <laughs> that the famous of the story world. of him? Was he wearing cowboy boots on that trip? Was that the one? And that was when he was coming, when we were heading out for a train and I was coming in, into the hotel one morning with his cowboy boots and a big uh, Stetson hat on. <laughs> we all just acknowledged, no, we were heading that way, he was at the, the, the buffet yeah. breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> you know, ma mark respect, yeah. Noel. Yeah. <laughs> and tip of the can. Very, good, very good, very good, very good. Right, we've well, lots to chat to you about, so we're going to get into all of that. Yeah, you're both very welcome. So uh, keep your comments coming in and get in touch with us over the next hour and a little bit. We've lots coming your way between now and probably about a quarter past nine or thereabouts uh, last week. I think it was about 20 to 10 before we wrapped up or even more, so we'll try and trim it off a little bit this week if we possibly can. Going to tell you what's happening in the back pages of the newspapers in just a few moments. Uh, some good stories there ahead of the weekend. We're going to talk uh, Leinster Racing. Alan Quinlan is going to join us in the studio to preview that game, so uh, Kenny is going to be on his best behaviour for that slot too. I know he's a keen interest in the, uh, the rugby, so we'll get Kenny's thoughts on it as well. The Champions Cup final, which will be live on Off the Ball and News Talk over the weekend. Uh, Martin O'Neill has named his a uh, large squad for the upcoming friendlies, so get Kenny's thoughts on that too. Uh, Mayo Galway, 
is uh, really, I know the championship landed with a bit of a bang last week as it turned out with that uh, New York Leitrim game, but Mayo Galway is going to be our focus this week. James Horne is going to be at that game for us, so we'll uh, have a chat about that shortly. And also we have a very special feature uh, with the Ireland and Leinster centre, Robbie Henshaw, coming your way a little bit later in the show as well. We've been uh, down to his home neck of the woods down in the Midlands uh, and finding out a very different side uh, to Robbie Henshaw and to his family. And we're going to bring you all of that uh, before we leave you at 9 o'clock. It's back on the music theme uh, for that one. So that's all coming your way very shortly. But before all of that, it is time for the newspapers. OTB AM. In association with AIR. Get AIR Sport free with AIR Broadband. All right, it's uh, 10 to 8. Here's what's happening on the back pages this morning. We're going to start with the Irish Independent uh, first up here. And it's Martin O'Neill admits striker Gamble. Uh, this is uh, dominates a lot of the papers today and the fact that O'Neill has made his squad for the upcoming friendlies and really our lack of somebody who's going to bang in Robbie Keane style goals is uh, the pretty evident thing from that uh, last year's medal means nothing says a very interesting Michael Dara McCauley which uh, again a piece that features in a lot of the papers today as well and he's been in to chat to OTBAM so we're going to bring you some of that too before we leave you a little bit later and Larmer's set to get wing berth for final with McGrath still a risk so uh, yeah, Luke McGrath still a bit of an injury doubt for Leinster, although he'd probably start, and uh, all of which means that Jordan Larmer is going to probably get the nod on the wing. So that uh, those teams I think are named around midday or thereabouts. Uh, Alan Quinn is going to talk to us about that. And on, and it's rugby too on the front page of the sports section of the Irish Times this morning. You get uh, you want to get that respect. You want to be able to stand over uh, something from your time is the uh, quote here from Tyg Furlong in conversation with Jerry Thornley ahead of that big game this weekend. Uh, more pre-game analysis from Liam Tolan there. And Danny Cipriani brought back into the uh, England setup by Eddie Jones, who's had some very interesting stuff to say about his uh, recall player, including that if his character is not right, he's going to be back on the uh, plane on their return flight from South Africa. So that is uh, Eddie Jones there. The Irish Examiner this morning needed to say it's uh, rugby all the way here, Racing 92. We built little things. We built things in little blocks, uh, says Ronan Agar in the meeting room, dressing room and on the team bus. So always uh, interesting stuff from Ronan Agar there. He talks about um, Kenny, his time, he's left. Uh, Racing Metro now to go to the Canterbury Crusaders and has taken up a coaching role there but talks about the culture that when he arrived at Racing Metro there were French rugby culture is generally known for its sort of left field way of doing things and uh, they were drinking full fat cans of coke big tubs of butter sort of 20 yards Batch of Batch loaves Batch loaves I'd say <laughs> a French badge <laughs> 20 hours up the road from K KFC and the lads by all accounts were filling their boots and a big part of his job was to, as he says, confiscate the goodies and sort of... I suppose more, and edu a more of an culture. educational thing, I suppose, rather than in kind of, yeah, literally hiding the, the goodies. Yeah, that, that takes time. That surprised me a little bit, actually, to be honest with you. I would have thought it'd be the opposite somewhat in terms of the, the, the French operate. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Bernard Jackman tells a story about he was coaching over there at Grenoble up to last year, about 18 months ago, and the uh, biggest challenge he, had, he said he had was to try and get the players not to have a second dessert a day that uh, you know one is enough lads you know so that's the yeah, what right. I find incredible about this is that both of them coached this decade it's not like this is the good old days of the 1990s when yeah. uh, like the, the pre Arsene Wenger days said a George Graham era at Arsenal which you'd hear similar stories to this is this decade it's yeah. incredible how far yeah. behind French yeah. club rugby was you're right because back in the day of course it was, was it was ignorance really it was a lack of edu education of would have some sympathy for mm. the players of a, a generation or so ago but yeah like you say of the last kind of 10 years that information's out there it's been preached it's generally accepted in terms of the do's and don'ts you know, in terms of your lifestyle and how you treat your body, etc. So, yeah, mm. that is surprising. The worry would almost be nearly that a French rugby ever got its shit together. That uh, we <laughs> 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 What is Ron O'Gara doing? <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us will be, uh, will be kind of screwed. Yeah. Uh, right, the uh, Times Ireland edition here. Scoring is a big problem, says O'Neill. So, again, this is uh, reflections on, uh, I mean, it's John Walters and Chen Long are sort of recognised strikers. Uh, and the fact that he's named his squad there, Noble and Pogba face off. Uh, this was the most interesting thing about that nil-nil draw uh, last night. Mark Ooh. Noble, all of about four foot two, and Paul Pogba, all of about eight foot seven, uh, getting a bit of grill time. 
It was it's a bad uh, beat today. They get a nasal clean or something. Uh, giving them their eyes. He was awful. giving them. I'm a bit surprised that there was a bit of sort of retrospective action there because he had his fingers in areas that he should have got sent off. Yeah, uh, I'm surprised he didn't. But what was hilarious was the way they made up after the game, and then Mark Noble was in the media centre afterwards, kind of laughing, it, laughing it off, and he was saying, "Ah, oh, Paul Pogba, he's one of the world's best players. He deserves a bit more respect." And somebody's like, well, you do realise what happened on the yeah. pitch today. And he's like, oh, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, Mark, that actually. classic get away jail card, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's another story in that paper there today, uh, an exclusive by Matt Dickinson, saying that Premier League referees may take the lead from American football by making live announcements to the crowds to explain VAR decisions as the game seeks to improve how it communicates with spectators. Oh, God, no. Oh, no. Don't get me started Not having the VAR. That, yeah, no, I think it's a great decision. They've made not introducing the VAR next year. They're taking a big step back. Really? The Premier League. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's Why? Gonna, the World Cup in this summer in particular, I think, there'll be an education. I think it's going to go belly up. Why, why do you think you know, that? Like, I mean, it, no, I'm, I'm, I've, I've never been in favour of it. I, people say, oh, that's it now. We can't go back. I'd go back in an instant, in, in a heartbeat. I'd go back really? the way. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Why? No, I just think it's a slippery slope. I, I just uh, to where? What, like, what's the, what's the end? What's at the bottom? The end of the game is the, slope? Again, the, the game will uh, the game will change uh, into a game that we just don't know in, in terms of the amount of stops, uh, starts, the inconsistencies. Uh, doesn't, doesn't it ultimately get so uh, like a big sort of VR has been has had its issues, and I think that actually hasn't helped things at all. We haven't There's even seen it. It's not. We haven't even. It's not even yeah. the tip of the iceberg again but, in terms of the issues that we're gonna face. So, but it, actually, probably what will happen is that most of those issues will actually start to iron out a small bit, and it'll get. It should get better. Would be the idea. No, but people start demanding more of it at the moment. It's kind of goal Here, scoring. Here's a question. Getting, opportunity here's a question. Sending if off. It was working, if it was key working, moments. if it was working properly, like it should work. Would you be in? That's for, my point. I'll never. I don't not ever if, see it if, work if properly. It was, if it was, people in the heads perceived to be working. If properly. it was to work properly, would you be pro? No, having no, because I can. I can't see that uh, eventually ever, ever arising. If, if like some people's perceptions, referees' perceptions, and what they perceive to be fair, and what what they don't. That that that's never always going to like, exist. Well, but, absolutely. But the stuff that's clear cut, if it could. If it could eradicate, what is clear cut? What is clear? Some some people looking and say that's clear cut. It's a red card. Somebody else will look and say that's that's never been a red card. That's that's a yellow card. But there, so some of it will definitely. There will be a percentage of those decisions that will definitely be. Yeah. Will remain yeah, open yeah. to interpretation. So what about the sacrifice there, to but get but there their agent? There will be some of the replays that you look at that you'll yeah. go very clearly. That's either yeah. a penalty. I agree. I agree. So, but that makes but the game what, what it's going to cost us now because the game will be it'll fragment. The whole game will fragment. We've seen it already. You know, inside the stadiums, the stadium just goes flat, uncertainty amongst players, what's going on here. And people are talking about now putting big video screens up. My God, talking about, that makes things ten times it's, worse. As people be looking at, again, taking the same stance as referees. Some supporters be looking at thinking, hold on, that's not freaky. Others be saying, that's an out outrageous, of course it's a penalty kick. That's only going to yeah. light the, the torch so, even so more. In a lot of sports like cricket and in rugby, when they go to the sort of similar scenarios, yeah. it's actually, they're some of the most dramatic moments of the game. Like, you've had some unbelievable drama. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen one amount of drama. It's been absolutely, it's, it's been boring. The game has just gone absolutely flat. I do, I'm not a fan of it at all. I can't see where it's going. My theory on this whole VAR thing in the Premier League, because the Premier League seems to have been the only ones that have gone in a different direction to other clubs, to other leagues in Europe. And I disagree with the point that they're the ones who are forward thinking here. I actually think that the Premier League are just reluctant to take this sort of risk. And I think it's kind of symptomatic of the Premier League as a whole. If this was to happen, you would need to install big screens in Old Trafford, for example. And if you look at some of the quotes that, that the Chiefs of Manchester United have made with regards to a big screen at Old Trafford, they've said things like a big screen would besmirch the tradition of our football club and stuff like that. I mean, those sort of nonsense quotes that seems to prevail in English football that is preventing English yeah, football from taking this leap. But that won't clear things up. That won't dissuade the supporters putting a big screen. But I just feel that that there's going to be more. There's going to be more. It's going to be more argument. Like I said, it's going to fan the flames uh, even more by throwing big contentious uh, decisions uh, decisions up on a on a big screen. I, 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 no, I, I'm not having it. I'm not having it at all. And and this in terms of key decisions in a game, we're not going to step into key decisions. You talk to managers. What's a key decision? Well, that throw in which we never got. 45 seconds before the goal was scored, absolutely So key. is your worry that actually that it becomes greater than, its influence becomes oh, greater than... Oh, it's absolutely going to roll it out. At the moment it's like, well, uh, it's a, a goal scoring opportunity, it's a, it's a red card penalty kick, let's just limit that. No way, people are going to be pushing the envelope out over the next couple of years. Now, what about that a free kick we should have been awarded at the other end of the pitch? That was a key moment, we would have got that, they never would have counted. So what about, the, what about those moments where a penalty is given, a key decision in the game, a penalty is wrongly given uh, yeah, for, no problem. I'll suffer it. I'll, really? I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll suffer it. I'll, yeah, the game hasn't suffered up up, to, up up till now because of it. One, one of the I'll things. Gladly, I'll well, gladly we kind of missed out in the World Cup because of it. Yeah, us. no problem. 
Oh, no problem. That's part and parcel. Human error is part and parcel. One of the, the things game. that pe people have sort of said in relation to not having VR is that the talkability is gone. That you won't have those, you know, people in the pub. Not so much the talk. Well, not actually, the talkability. I think it's become even greater. It, like the conversation about. Oh, the, I know, but it's boring. It's absolute. I can't engage a conversation with someone now. And again, that stage of VR, just don't even want to talk to people. Apart from you to this morning, obviously, but no, it's boring. Uh, it really is. The one, same, same to, old things. To are relieve you of the boredom. One quick thing that stri strikes me just before we leave that West Ham uh, United game was that uh, just before the Noble incident actually Andy Carroll had been in a tank with Pogba I don't know if you'd seen yeah, that saw, yeah. so he Carroll gets sort of reprimanded by the referee he does the usual thing of sort of walking away before the referee even gets a chance to give him his instructions referee insists that he comes back he gets sort of halfway back not that interested gets to the referee sort of bends down to <laughs> pretend to do his socks showing absolutely zero respect to the referee who's getting increasingly irate with this old scenario to the point where the referee just stands there and waits for him to get up and actually get some face time yeah. with him how long are we going to have to go here before the referee just says, listen, right, like, like we go... No, I'm going to go the opposite now. Now, I'm going to cut you down there. Why is the referee pulling him over? Because, I'll tell you why he's pulling him he's over. He's going to pull him over to say, now, Andy, come on, better, better, please, Andy, better. Is that it? Is it but, worth but, it? Like, what show, him, show him the yellow card. But ultimately, ultimately, the referee is the one who, he's in charge of the game, so he gets to call it like it is, he's, and there's no and respect. he's called it, and he's called it, he's given no him a free kick. And if he wants to give him the yellow card, give him the yellow card. Does it really matter if he's two yards away or if he's twenty I just yards away? I, this I, kind of charade. No, come, no, come, come. No, here, because, stand because, here because what Carl is doing, Carl is showing utter disrespect. Right? He's like, nah, I'm sort of not that interested in talking to you. He, the referee for me has got to start booking players like that, and that's going to stamp it out. Like you, you'll stamp no, that no, out. No, I wouldn't go that. No, I would, you're not going to stamp it out that quickly. That's kind of. But it's not that's healthy. A it's little not bit. healthy. It's not healthy. No, though. it's not. Yeah, but it's all apparent. People, people accept that. It's a little bit different. Now there's the the rugby analogy in terms. Respect between the officials and the players, and that's a natural thing. Always has been. That never, never been the case with football. I'm not looking for a massive groundswell in, in terms of change there. Just keep it simple. Just yellow card them. This kind of nonsense of oh, I've got to be seen to be on the referee. You've got to respect my authority. Get over here now. No, now I said <laughs> this. Kenny, we're, going to, we're going to agree to this. No man, yeah, we are for the entire morning. So. A quick look at the Irish news this morning. It's uh, the Cava manager here, Will will win the day, uh, says Madlina there. And finally to the uh, Racing Post, back to the big time. This is just uh, reflections here on the uh, playoffs for this weekend. Moving swiftly onto the Irish Daily Mail, the back page says, kicking back, Wexford and Dublin did not train abroad. That's Philip Lanigan's story here. It was Lee Chin and Kieran Kilkenny doing some media yesterday. They've both been uh, under question, the Wexford and Dublin camps, with regards to training camps. Dublin uh, were in the Somme last week, uh, and they've said that there was no training at all, really, to the trip. That's what uh, Kilkenny said. So they did not have, have training that, relations that with that uh, war memorial, is what they're saying. Are you having that? Uh, well, you know, you got to take them at their word. I'm not. I'm not going to say Lee Chin and uh, Kieran Uncle Kenny are uh, telling us lies here because bend, you know bending the truth there slightly. I'd well, I, I wasn't in their training camp. You know, I, if I went to the Battle of the Somme, I, I'm like I'm ready to. Oh, the, the actual Battle of the Somme. Sorry, I was at the Somme <laughs> where a battle occurred <laughs> oh, 100 situation. years ago. <laughs> um, I, you know, like I mean, there, he was it, never going over the top, was he? Oh, let, let's be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huddle down with that tin hat on. No worry about that. <laughs> Listen to his hip hop, Kenny. He's <laughs> no interest. I, I would have, uh, I would have avoided conscription. I wouldn't have even been in the trenches, Kenny. Uh, the front page of the Herald Sports section says the final furlong, rising tag. Uh, is lifting Leinster. Tag furlong is across the back pages this morning ahead of the Champions Cup final tomorrow. It's Sam or me. This is an interesting story. The back page of the Mirror this morning. Rooney wants to stay at Everton if Allardyce is shown the exit door. So it seemed that Wayne Rooney had agreed a move to go to DC United in the United States. But it seems now that if Everton want to keep him, they need to get rid of Sam Allardyce. So they've really got uh, an unenviable decision there to make between whether or not they keep Wayne Rooney or whether or not they keep Sam Allardyce. I've also got uh, Michael Darren McCauley there and that picture of uh, Mark Noble and Paul Pogba once again. Also, and this is tab of the morning to you this morning. Congratulations to the star. Big Sam or Uncle Sam, uh, Rooney yet to agree, MLS move, uh, well you've got Man of the Moments, that's a story which uh, Jockey Owen Mahan had a night to remember yesterday because uh, he wrote two winners, um, the first two winners of his career, which came to an incredible 1,733 to 1 double. 22-year-old uh, jockey, an incredible first two winners for him. And uh, if you were on that, well, congratulations. And Michael Darren McCauley there again. You've also got Noble and Pogba again, as they are here in the back of the sun. 
snout of order, but Jose knows they're second. That's another good couple of puns there. While Euro Super League is coming, we might chat to, to Kenny a little bit about that later on in the show. Arsene Wenger convinced that a, a European-wide Super League is on the way. Raging Noble escapes red, says the front of the Daily Telegraph. And then finally on the back page of The Guardian this morning, it is that picture once again. Tempers flare before Mourinho seals second. And that interesting rugby story that doesn't involve the Champions Cup, it is the England squad. Warning shot. Step out of line and you will go home, Jones tells Cipriani. Danny Cipriani is back in the England squad, which I'm actually really looking forward to this tour this summer because I reckon, as the old adage goes, shit could hit the fan and uh, hopefully it does. Not a guy that um, sort of succeeded all that well due to his character, we're led to believe, under the Martin Johnson and uh, Stuart Lancaster reigns. But you would think that he's a perfect fit for somebody like Eddie Jones. Or an absolutely nightmare fit for Eddie Jones. We just don't know. We don't know how those personalities are going to clash. But, yeah. And hopefully they clash in the most uh, horrible way and you know, England rugby spirals out of control in the, in the coming months. <laughs> Even more so. Even more so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Short French story. rugby. And, <laughs> and French rugby. Let's try it. Yeah. I've got popcorn yeah. in the Despite microwave. Ronald O'Gara's <laughs> best efforts. <laughs> Five past eight this Friday morning. Delighted to have you along with us. Keep your comments coming in. We're going to bring those to Kenny as we go. And also to Alan Quinlan, who we're going to preview the Champions Cup final with in just a minute. Kenny is staying with us as well. Uh, two of our favourite pundits, of course. And uh, here's another one. Tommy Walsh in the show last night. You look across all sports. We all have the internet. We all have the different television channels. We're seeing the professional sports people. The top people, they want to win all the time because that's what leads to good habits. And Kilkenny, they've went out there. They've young players who have no All Ireland medals. They've no Leinster medals. They went out now and sampled big crowds, big crowds in Wexford Park, in Nolan Park, big crowds everywhere. And they've got a taste of both victory and, and defeat. So I think just for the guys' confidence, um, I heard uh, Kevin McStay, the Ross Common manager there before Christmas, and he was talking about confidence, how real confidence you get from the training ground, real confidence you get from working hard. Well, Kilkenny have got real confidence from this league. It's not. Just someone, maybe a psychologist, tapping into him, telling him to believe these were adventures, came through fierce battles and won. So I just think it was a great preparation for, for the championship. But um, I don't know, can you see the poster behind me, Tommy? I don't know, it's the shot there, but yeah. it's, a, it, it's a calendar of the Game of Thrones. And I don't watch it myself, uh, but they all watch it here at home. And... Um, <laughs> All the talk is, what's going to happen? Who's going to die this week? Next minute, they're down in the house here and they're, they're all chatting. I can't believe whoever, John Stark has died. I can't believe this person has died. But I think, Tommy, it's going to be the very same in this championship. Leinster and Munster. We won't believe some of the results. But um, I think it's, it's just, it's set up for, it's, a, it's, it's one of the most wonderful times, I think, to be a Kilkenny or an inter-county supporter. And it's a wonderful time to be part of the, the, the management or playing teams because there's going to be so many big matches. And then you have the whole home and away side of things, which is going to be, you know, will it be like the, the, the soccer, the Champions League? Everybody Game of Thrones fans? Not me, no, unfortunately. Ready? Oh, up and down, up Ready? and down, yeah. To, to, when it first came out, all over, and yeah. then, yeah, fell off a cliff with it. That's incredible. It, too it much. got better. It was, really? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Well, once John Stark died, I mean... Did he? Did he? Yeah. That's what I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I go, it's like one of the Ewings, in it? One of the Ewings he got killed. Who was, who, who was the Ewings? Dallas? Bobby. Dallas. Oh, was sorry. It? Bobby. Was it Bobby? Jay, no, came back. The ghost who got came shot? back. Bobby got shot. Yeah, but in the he came back. Yeah, but it, was, it didn't happen. It was a dream. Yeah, it was. Well, yeah. You never JR know. JR got never shot. Quite I shot JR. Sure. Do you remember your man in Father Ted? I shot yeah. JR. I shot JR. I'm not sure. Quinny, welcome. Thanks, Eddie. We didn't give you any official welcome to the studio. Right, then. you don't have to. Um, we've had a lot of uh, contacts wondering if Kenny got out the uh, right side of bed this morning, and people on Facebook said, get a good coffee into Kenny. They're a bit grumpy this morning. Wouldn't get a good coffee around here, would you? Let's He's be just been disputing grumpy. everything we've had to say. That's terrible. No, no, if, you don't, if you don't tell the party line, Alan, suddenly yeah, your, yeah, your yeah, time has been grumpy yeah, yeah, around <laughs> this place. I'm just sort of relaying what, um, what the, what the oh, viewers are saying. Oh, saying off air. We've, oh, um, I'm not getting involved in this. On that uh, note, we've um, a doppelganger shot. We want to we want to uh, show you here, lads. Just have a quick look at this. Oh, that's not a bad call. That is not a bad call, actually. That is the uh, Leinster senior oh, coach, Stuart Lancaster. Stuart there, well. <laughs> Stuart Cunningham. <laughs> What's his personality like, Alan? What's he like? Bit of a character. Uh, yeah, he's and nice. He's nice. Then. He's nice. Very quite refined. Oh. He's definitely in favour of VAR as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, that's and like respect for referees. Uh, right, um, Leinster Racing. Quinny, tomorrow night, it's a game that's live and off the ball. Dave is going to be down there, and uh, I think he's with Liam Tolan and Keith Wood for a commentary of it. Um, talk to us about this. Leinster are sort of seemingly making all the right noises about, you know, favourites don't mean anything when it comes to this stage of the tournament, but what's your initial read on, uh, on this one? 
Um, like most people, I think I fancy Leinster to win. Um, I think you'd be, I'd be a little bit nervous that, and aware of the threat Rossing pose. Um, I think in an ideal world, they want to start the game like they did in, in um, against Munster in the semi-final, um, get something on the board early, be in the game. If Leinster start like they did against Scarlets, uh, it'll be big trouble for them because um, I think they have a lot of belief, even though they have a lot of young players in this side, there's, there's a great mix of experience mm. as well. And uh, if Leinster, just the way they've played this year has been phenomenal. I think uh, maybe in the Exeter game, in the first game, half at home, they were you know, a little bit under under underperformed there and didn't look their best. But some of the performances throughout the year, the, the away bonus point win in Glasgow, after that match, I thought, there's something really steely about this side. Um, you know, very, very impressive in against Saracens, getting the job done in the quarterfinals, and against Scarlets, they were outstanding. So they have that ability. They can vary their game across the board. So powerful up front and great, great attacking threat. And they execute so well. And I think that was the big thing. So they'll be full of confidence. That sometimes can make you a little bit, um, uh, you know, not aware of, of what's going on around you and the threat. So I'm sure Leo Cullen and Stuart Lancaster and John Fogarty, Gervin Dempsey, all the coaches will be chatting the guys for the last two weeks about um, you know the threat Racing can pose. Because if you look at their team sheets, you know someone like Vakatawa, Nakarawa, yeah. um, Teddy Tama, Siobhan is a good centre, Dan Carter is probably going to be on the bench. So if you start naming off the Racing players, World Cup winners in there, big international players and, and the one thing that Racing will pose more than Munster posed was probably more of a physical presence, you know, not just up front but throughout the, the back line as well. They're big, strong, physical guys and they have an ability. So if you underestimate them in any way, I don't think Leinster will underestimate them. I think they've they've enough about them to, to get the job done, I think. You mentioned the occasion there. Like, what's this week like in the build-up to a European Cup final? Like, Tag Furlong is quoted in a lot of the papers this morning as having this just immense pride of being the Wexford representative in this Leinster team, and you, of course, yourself would have represented your locality within your own province, your home province, in these huge occasions. Do you appreciate that in the week of it? Because obviously the, the um, preparation for the game. Yeah, itself. you're you're aware of it. I think you're aware of of where you've come, your own journey, what's it all about. Um, you think it a pre-season. The fitness sessions, the weight sessions, the sacrifices and missing out loads of stuff. And, and it's similar for the guys who played in the Grand Slam. The effort, the time, the pressure that goes into that stuff. And this is for Leinster. They've had a fantastic year. Um, it's, it's incredible to think the amount of games that we've, they've won. I think Johnny Sexton's played, been involved in 19 games this year and he's hasn't lost one. Mm. Um, if you go back to the, right back to the Lions tour, um, James Ryan's never lost professional game. Yeah. Um, Unbelievable, it's isn't it? So young, like, <laughs> and amazing, uh, yeah, I'm envious because you know when I would have started, you're losing games, you're kind of learning yeah. hard lessons along the way. You same as yeah, you yeah. in football, and uh, these guys have just been. It's an upward trajectory throughout the season, and uh, you you maybe possibly think then that you know they're going to get a bit of a wallop at some stage. Something's going to go wrong. They're going to maybe underperform, but all the evidence yeah. is, is suggesting that. They're really resilient, they have a lot of tenacity, and that they just believe every time they go out in the field they're going to win. And um, for, for, for Tyke Furlong to speak about that, I can relate to that because this is why you play the game. Mm. You want to be in the big finals, and it's a special week. I, um, you know, when we played in Heineken Cups as it was, it was um, just a real sense of excitement. There'll be loads of Leinster people, it'll be packed out. It's a bit of a journey off to Bilbao. Mm. Um, and it's a special, special week for that me. That kind of complacency you're kind of alluding to it there, you would have thought the more experienced players, Alan, within the dressing room would just stamp on that. There's yeah, even an someone England, like Johnny Sexton. that bubbling to the who, sofa, they'll sense it, won't they? Yeah, someone like Sexton has been through, through the mill and, uh, you know, maybe learned a few hard lessons along the way. He's still won three Heineken Cups. This is phenomenal. They're going to equal Toulouse's record of winning four. Four players in, in that team can win, win their fourth medal, which is unbelievable. Only two other players have done that. Um, Cedric Hamans and Freddie Michelak. Mm. They're the only people who've won four medals. There's four Leinster guys tomorrow can equal that Incredible, record. So it's phenomenal. Yeah. And you think, um, you think this, you look at their team sheet, you think in the squad they have at the moment with all the young players, they think, you think they're capable of going on and winning three or four of them if, if, you know, if they get it right. I saw Toulon a few years ago and I thought this team are capable of winning about five 
Heineken Cups and the trot. They won three and then they dro they've dropped off since. But So it is hard to win trophies, no matter who you are and how good you are. Getting the job done is, 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 is tricky. So for anyone who thinks it's going to be just easy, turn up, it's going to be normal service, they might have to dog it out tomorrow. They might not even... You know, it might not be this free-flowing performance, brilliant performance, but the most important thing for them is get the job done. You, uh, <clears throat> Kenny's mentioned about complacency and the influence in the, in the dressing room, and I mean, two key players for either side here tomorrow, he's in the same way, obviously, on one side, and Dunnick Ryan on the other, and like, listen to a lot of stuff that people who've played with him have said, including uh, Joel Katoko just this week, saying that what an influence he's been on the squad since since he's been there. Ron Agara, we mentioned a bit earlier, I was talking to his examiner column this morning about uh, his own, the way he had to try and change the culture of wrestling when he went over there. How possible are, what's the challenges for a player like Dunnick going in there? Like, how difficult is it for one player to try and change that? Because it's different dynamic from Agara. He's a coach, he can do those sort of things. But from a player's point of view, he seems to be already a really important voice in that dressing room. It's, it's risky because when you go to France, they're a little bit more laid back. They rely more on individual talent rather than the collective unit. Mm. You know, we would have won a Heineken Cup in 2006, and probably individually, we weren't. We had some world-class players for sure, but the the 23 that or 22 that went out that day probably weren't the best 22 in Europe. Um, but collectively, we were unbelievably tight. We had that desire, that passion, that work ethic as a group. Guys doing the hard yards behind the scenes, squad players who, you know, contributed so well. And and to have that kind of a scenario, that's kind of what we pride ourselves in Ireland now. In all the provinces, is that extra work ethic that sacrifice off the field about not having the nights out, watching your diet. And that culture is still a little bit different. And any guys who've played in France or coached in France will tell you there's a frustration there about getting guys to do extra stuff, watching videos, analyzing the opposition, maybe not going out on a Wednesday night for a meal and having that, the few glasses of wine. It and seems stuff like, like that, that was policed by the players almost more than it was by the coaches at Munster in yeah, that time. Yeah, it would have been, but it was kind of, look, there was a lot of us there since 97, 96, 97, who, you know, at the start, we probably didn't believe we could win, but then we saw a little bit of a chink of light, and then we said, you know, there was a real intrigue about how we can get better as a group. You know, we were in that, we had a little bit of leeway as regards the expectancy and the pressure as regards winning. We weren't expected to win, but we got a little taste of it, particularly getting to that final in 2000. And then we were like, well, how do we get better? And there was an, just a number of guys who were really kind of intrigued and determined to find out, well, how can we train harder? How can we get better at our diet? Um, how can we get better facilities? How can we get better coaching? Mm. And that's probably the challenge for Rassinger for a lot of these French yeah. teams to have the players well, be the ones that are. They have a lot that. of guys from all over the place, yeah. international players there's from all over enough, the world. There's been a lot, I wouldn't say the French market's been flooded with players, but there's been enough of them over the past it, couple of years. It has been flooded with them, Kenny. The but it's like a soccer team if Chelsea come together. How do you put, when, when they've won the league first, how do you put all these superstars together and have that? passion and desire and work ethic. Maybe there's been too many superstars and not enough of the Dunnock Rhymes. Sometimes. Well, actually. a lot of the French clubs, like, you, you hear about the massive money that some guys are on and then you see him perform and you think, how? what does it mean to him? The one thing about I, the Irish players here, because you're literally playing for your livelihood and your job and mm. your family and you, you have that kind of sense that, well, I, need, I can't drop mm. the ball here because someone will take my place or I might get a contract next year. And it's kind of like incentivized to get better all the time. And, um, you know, so that that's kind of a mentality. Like, Dunica would have went to, to Paris now, and I heard Joe Rocathoco speaking during the week about he's always having little meetings, he's always yeah. trying to get the forwards to watch the lineouts. Because we were obsessed with lineouts and video sessions and w analyzing the opposition. Whereas the French, a lot of the time, we knew that, you know, they just kind of focus on training themselves and not really, they didn't really maybe rate the Irish players at times, and um, maybe that sounds harsh, but they didn't put in those extra hours. And, um, you know, that's why if you get good overseas players in France into the culture, into the group, and if you get it right, they can inspire the French, who are a little bit more laid back. That's their culture a little bit. And um, he's brought that extra bit of intensity. You know, his focus against Munster would have been how they play, lineouts, who's making the calls, body language of guys, little details that maybe they wouldn't have gone off individually on their own checking out and it makes a difference then, you know. So he'll look at Leinster tomorrow and, you know, he'll have uh, all that French pack tomorrow really known the Leinster pack inside out. Step off left foot, 
holding right hand, fend with left hand, all those little details that he'll really try to break it down. And I think, you know, it's not the French way. Um, and in fairness, they've, they've probably proven over the years when they get on the front foot and play rugby, they're probably as good as mm. anyone, as good as New Zealand, and, and they've proven that. But the way the game has gone now, those minute details make a big difference. And that's something Dunica would have been really, really precise on all the time. And he would have learned from the likes of Paul O'Connell, who Paul was always just so good at watching the opposition, analysing his own game as well. How can he get better at his height into rocks, passing ability, all that kind of stuff. So Dunica is naturally kind of um, has that, that desire. I think that argument now, Alan, this argument, of, and you hear a lot of in different sports in terms of let, let, let them worry about us. You know, let's not worry too much about it. It's been an, almost a negative kind of mm. mindset. Let, let, let them worry, worry about us. We'll concentrate on but ourselves coach, and not take note of the strengths and weaknesses. I mean, that's, that argument now is redundant. I cringe when I hear managers and coaches now make that argument. You see it even now in football on, on the weekend. Managers, now we're not going to worry too much. No, we haven't worked on that. But probably behind the, the scenes, they're probably... They're well, no, I don't. Surely no, they, surely no they I are. don't. I think there are. There well, are managers well, and coaches well, certainly in rugby, you'll have your video analyst who will provide all that detail. So... Any of the players in, uh, in, in particularly in the Irish setups with the Irish team, now Mervyn Murphy is there, f you know, 15, 20 years, but you go in and Mervyn will have all the details of your opposition number, what way he carries, what's his strength, is he good on the right side, you know, does he step off left, right foot, whatever. It can, it, it just, it, it's up to the, the, the player themselves to go and understand their opposition. Mm. If you're playing against a striker who likes to take you on the right hand side and you don't really know that, and he takes yeah. you a beach on the right hand side three but times. It can't, and it can't just be the information's there, go on and use it if you want. At some point, you've got, you've got to like, drag people well, in there. The particular unit you're talking about, football, the defensive unit, or whatever it is, the scrum line. You got, initially, you've got to drag people in there as a coach, as a manager. You've got to get a bit of scruff in there and drag them in and make them aware of this. Look, you, you've got to absorb this, you've got to get this information in. This yeah. is going to make you better, it's going to make the collective better. And hopefully, over time, uh, over time that'll become a natural thing for players to go in. But that initial kind of resistance, which is still there I'm talking about it's still prevalent even with football managers you're talking about that analysis type thing ah, too much information it's messing with their heads I don't need that pushing the sports science the analysts away now we don't, I don't want you in that, that type of mindset that's, that's got to change it has changed but there's still but there's rugby still is unbelievably professional here yeah. in Ireland with that kind of detail that's presented and, and I think it makes a difference so that's something that Dunica would have brought what, what are the video analysts at Racing looking out for for Lencer? how can they win this game tomorrow well they look at the, their attacking threats particularly off middle to the tail of line out the way the 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 dummy runners the ball out the back um you know their kicking game but Leinster can play it a number of different ways they can play hard up front they can play uh, you know they can a lot of good ball carriers they look at Levy's threat over the ball um cross field kicks from Sexton he'll try and isolate their wingers and particularly that kind of attacking threat so i think the set piece is really important um particularly in the line out if Leinster win good quality ball in the middle towards the tail of the line out, then that's it's really good to attack and run onto that. You know, Henshaw runs a hard line, does it go straight to him? Does it go behind him? You know, we saw against Scarlets the way Nasiba can kind of link in off the wing and run in behind that back line and be really dangerous. So it makes a massive difference. And that's the kind of area, that's Dunnick's area he'll be running the line out from. So how can he stop that kind of scenario where they win line outs and, 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 and launch those attack plays? All right, there's lots more that we'd love to chat to you about, Quinny, including Dan Carter. You've sort of written him off already. I know Roger's saying that if he was in the coaching staff that he'd have him on the team. Well, his presence is massive for them yeah. as well, you know, having that experience of being there before. And and maybe, and just maybe, with Mashino out, that maybe Carter gets a nod. We'll see. I think the team's going to be named uh, around lunch today, so we shall yeah. see. Call it first before I you leave. I think they'll us. win. I think Leinster will win. Um, yeah, I think... You don't, say, you don't seem to say points. that with any joy whatsoever. It's uh, Well, <laughs> how could I, you know what I mean? I'm not going to lie. Um, but I want him to win, to be I fair. I yourself and Zebo um, sort of... Him to win. When, That's you play, for me. when you, play, him when to you win. play for Munster for 15 years and you've been through some, you don't hear Gary Neville saying he wants Liverpool to win, do you? <laughs> or, or Jamie Carragher saying <laughs> ah, he wants no, United to win. I'm no, but genuinely, when you're out of the kind of the bubble, you know, I think it's, it's they deserve to win, and, and I think they will win. Be grudging, be grudging. Be grudging, absolutely. Yeah. He is grumpy this morning. <laughs> <laughs> He's grumpy every morning, I think that's the short story. Uh, Quinny, thanks a million for coming in. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. Uh, Alan Quinlan there on analysis of that game for the weekend. We're going to have much more from uh, Kenny in uh, very shortly. But uh, before all of that, we're going to hear from John O'Shea, I think, and uh, his decision to... Uh, he was talking to Kevin on last night's show about his decision to retire from international football. Um... Just, I, I'd spoken to Martin previously, obviously. Uh, well, nice and pretty. Well, obviously, with the 
the game against the games against Denmark in particular, and uh, the games obviously he kind of was he he was probably aware that, and we were both aware like obviously I wasn't going to be going on for the next campaign, and the ideal scenario was obviously to to get to Russia and to make the squad for Russia. Um, that was the, the would have been the obviously the the, the plan if everything had uh, gone okay. And uh, but once that was out of the way, and then obviously um, I was wanting to just get the season out of the way, and then I'd met Martin uh, and spoke to spoken to him a couple of times, and uh, he had said to me, "Look, what about uh, what about we go for the the a game against the." be captain for the last game at home against the USA and uh, yeah I thought it would be, be, be a nice way to, to finish things up you know yeah, that's John O'Shea in conversation with Kevin on last night's Off The Ball. You can check out that full piece on offtheball.com. I do want to let you know as well that uh, to celebrate the release of the uh, brand new Liverpool FC home kit, uh, which is going to be uh, released today, we're giving you and a mate the opportunity to meet the Liverpool and Republic of Ireland legend Jason McAteer tomorrow. That's at the uh, Liverpool FC store from 10 o'clock in the morning. He'll be at Dublin's ILAC shopping centre there, so get yourself along. Places are limited uh, so you can make sure to register for tickets to avoid any disappointment. Uh, tickets are free, but you must register and uh, show your ticket on the day. You can head over to offtheball.com to register uh, for tickets to that. Uh, that's Jason McIntyre. He'll be in conversation with uh, Nathan Murphy. It's at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Had a pretty nice gig to uh, get yourself along to Kenny. You'll be down there queuing up. Any tickets available? Tickets still available? Listen, we'll see. We know a fella who might be able to... Will I get a mention? Will I get a mention? Probably not. Um, so John O'Shea has called time. Kenny in his international career. That's it. He's done. He's He's out. He's gonna. I think uh, you were saying have a bit of a send off for the in the USA game and these uh, these friendlies. Yeah, so it was it was mentioned. I think Martin mentioned he will be part of the squad, so he's part of the squad. I imagine he'll play. Yeah, like expected yeah, that expected part. that it would happen. Like it was. I think the right I thing to do so. that he stayed on up to this point to sort of he didn't always play the most fulsome part of the pitch, but I'm sure oh. he was a pretty good influence. About oh, the great influence! Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine that was the case, and uh, primarily why Martin would have wanted to keep him down. Sometimes it can be very tricky trying to manage older players when they're not getting their full amount of game time, they're not yeah. first picks. That can be difficult for older players uh, to deal with. Some don't take it very well. Uh, in some cases, you're better getting them out, whether it's club or international football, you're better showing them the door because it become a little bit toxic uh, around the dressing room. But clearly, John was never one of those, even from a very young age. I was very impressed with John, not just kind of his technical, but he was a lovely footballer when he first, first came in. It was our one when he came in just a year before the World Cup. But he was quite imposed. Quite, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Now, John, we've got to squeeze. Um, yeah. John, don't leave me isolated. Won't be one of the pitch. That's probably what I'm asking him. A lot of don't leave me alone. Give board, me, give me it? a little bit of cover. John's thinking, oh, here we go. I'm gonna be. There's no way the way they're grin the way they're grinning at you. That's yeah, but he's technically he was so good, Adrian. <clears throat> Left and right foot. It's a wonderful football. I remember coming on the train the pitch, little keep ball sessions we'd normally do. Right. You'd never see me in a keep ball session. I'd just hide for about 20 minutes. That's Kaka, oh. right? <coughs> I wouldn't be interested. Yeah, that's oh, yeah, 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 Kevin. No, Kevin Caban, that is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah Kaka in between us. You, yeah. you would have been in, um, we came into the squads around <laughs> sort of early 2000s and I was looking, it was the uh, Greece game in Athens, nil nil, that the two oh, of you would have, oh, wow, would have started yeah. in. There was yourself, Steve Finn and Richie Dunn. Um, Kevin's, yeah, Don t uh, took that team. Was he, that yeah, was just right. a transition period. Yeah. John, uh, Don just took the team, yeah. But what like you I said, it struck me, John, because. Impressed by him. Yeah, but just because he was a defender, but he's naturally left or right foot, soft feet. People say quick, soft, quick feet. Those are the key ball sessions, no problem to him. Drop his shoulder, plenty of touches on the mm. ball, and a real kind of calm uh, demeanour about him. A lot of confidence in his own ability, but not one of them would put it, throw it into your face. You could just sense, you could see the quality which he had. And his character as well, great young fella. He really, he really enjoyed the group. Yeah, really be, very quickly became an integral uh, part of the group. So... Yeah, no surprise to see he hung around for so long was the influence that he was. Amazing that he came in in 01. He missed the World Cup in 02. Yeah. Probably just came a little bit too quick for him. But, I mean, it had, he had to wait another, what, 11 years for his appearance at a major championships and the European Champions won at 12. I mean, that didn't do go, go too well collectively for the group under Trapattoni. But thankfully, four years later, he was a part of the squad under, under Martin. So, yeah. I'm saying I'm delighted for him. I don't think it's one of these. I think you can get too morose about thing. Oh, so sad. It's a, it, for me. It's a time for celebration. You know, he's 117 caps. 
uh, such an influential uh, player uh, within the squad, great character, someone who we should be proud of both on the human level and uh, from a professional point of view. So, yeah, I hope the game against the USA, if he gets some minutes on the pitch, it's a time for celebration. I hope him and his family enjoy the day. Would, so, he, he 2002 obviously missed out on and sort of started coming into squads and teams in a much more uh, fulsome way after that. As I mentioned, that was, the two of you would have, I was looking at it yesterday, there must have, it was over 20 games that the two of you would have started together, I think, up to 2005, the yeah. Switzerland game, where you were. I you couldn't get it? enough of younger legs around me. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's Richard, Richard, more Richard young Dunn, kids. Andy O'Brien, yeah. Steve Finn, and well, Steve that's what I'm saying, I was lucky. I but was the two of you were, were pretty much mainstays of that, uh, that team. You were the two that were sort of for injury reasons, I suppose, maybe to others and form and stuff, but yeah, were pretty much the mainstays. Well, we were looking that right back. We had some, some world-class people. I don't think people talk about it enough in terms of right backs. When I first came into the squad, Gary Kelly was there. You know, absolutely world-class in terms of full-backs. Steve Finn and Stephen Carr mm. was playing at level for a couple of years. I don't think there was any better in the world would have gone to any international team, any club team. Jeff Kenna in any other year probably would have got himself at least another uh, 30, 40 mm. caps. And then John arrived on the back end of that, but he was so versatile. Told John, mm. I only play left back, right back, centre half, even centre midfield on occasion. He played for Manchester, you know, such just such a natural. Yeah, like I was making this point yesterday with, with Keith that does he get underrated because of that? Because he's viewed as a utility player, which can be, which is kind of like a black mark against some players. When in actual fact, it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's certainly not underrated by his peers, the people who played with him, the managers he, he played under, for the and the reasons that I've said in terms of his his, uh, mm. his technical qualities. I'm very bright as well, a good reader of the game as as well, John. And, and just in terms of his uh, his medals total as well. I mean, he must be one of the most successful yeah. Irish players of all time. Well. He's got a huge amount to be proud of. I know he mentioned there, you're always looking you know, to go out say, with a bit of a bang in terms of his appearance at the World Cup this summer. That hasn't happened. A big turnaround in terms of the next qualifying campaign. So as soon as we didn't make it against Denmark, I think it was pretty obvious yeah. John was going to choose his moment. Just before we away. leave that aspect, was he the sort of guy that would have required a lot of guidance? Like, I mean, you've mentioned his confidence. I don't know if uh, start, uh, talking to Stephen Hunt about him before. He needed like a bit the, of guidance to get down to rights and in, uh, in Sours. Like, he, he wouldn't have wouldn't known the little venues, maybe, where he would have hung out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not what I'm talking about. Yeah, He's yeah, getting a very yeah, stern yeah, face. Yeah, yeah. No, he wouldn't. Uh, because he was—he was like this guy was a superstar as a kid. Like this was a guy yeah, exactly. who all the clubs in the UK were were chasing down. Yeah, but, yeah. No, no, not at all. No, he wouldn't have. From a footballing point, yeah. I think you young player, you're always learning the game. You develop. There's more you have to learn about the game, and yeah, I would have been one of the more experienced players. I wouldn't say like I gave John a you know a, a leg up or anything or played a part in his development. I wouldn't wouldn't say that at all. But as a young player, but John was very open. He, he would listen. But that was natural qualities which I spoke about. You know, pretty much blew you away. Uh, straight away, and I was, it was no surprise really became to such an became such an integral part of the squad in terms of his character, a big leader within the squad, and he became that figure mm. very quickly within the squad. I stepped away in 05, 06 and you could see even from the outside looking in, you could see John become that kind of lead, leadership figure within the squad, very much respected by the rest of the squad for those kind of leadership attributes as well as his obvious uh, football and qualities. Oh five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good day for Irish football, yeah, when I stepped away. But I'd like to ho hopefully be involved going forward. It's a difficult moment, when I say a difficult moment, you step away. We've all been there, ooh, where do I go now, what's, what's happening here? But um, John, John can really, you know, his many strengths was bowed. Will he go into coaching? I mean, there's been some conversation that he, Sunderland job might be <coughs> something he'd be, he'd be almost interested in. Yeah, from, possibly. From everything you're saying, it does sound yeah, like he's... Yeah, I think so, but I think there's many of those making. players I've played with who have that capability and who haven't for one reason or another, maybe they haven't had the opportunities, maybe they've decided to go down a different path. And that's a little, that's, that's a little bit sad, to be honest with you, because integrating a number of these players back into the set, even from an international point of view, you're talking about club football there, Adrian. Yes. But I'm talking about our international setup. You know, almost earmarking these players, like, and there's plenty of them uh, around there, a number of them have been on their coaching badges the last couple of years, and integrating these players. Actually, forget... Forget about saying, oh, it's great to see him getting a club in, in England. What about, well, hold on, let's get him yeah. over here. Let's get him integrating here, our younger age groups. Even around the scene, under 21 senior into international squad. Not, don't necessarily have to be our next manager, but like, um, you know, very talented coaches, a good eye for the game. Uh, the type of people who you really want to, uh, around the setup, that younger players, even the senior international players would benefit 
uh, from kind of ha- uh, having around. And John may, may may well be one of those players. Because that's the the thing that will always be said about, like, say, the Ireland squad that we're going to bring up in a moment. The, you think, start thinking to yourself, when will there be another Premier League winner in an Ireland squad? It could be 10 years before we have another Premier League winner wearing an Ireland jersey. But what people forget is just because we don't have any of them playing for Ireland anymore, we still have their potential expertise in the pool that is Ireland. That yeah. it is absolutely vital that that expertise stays within the Ireland camp. Otherwise, you know, yeah. the, the standards will start oh, to you're slip. Right. And you never hear that talk. We hear talk, well, what players can we get for the internationals? There's a lad out there, he can yeah. play for Orange, a young lad, let's go and get him. And we're always, you know, clambering over, said, where's the next centre forward we need it is? But there's never that talk and say, well, where, where's the next body of coaches that are going to come in? There was a chance Martin could have left a couple of months ago, some talk for maybe uh, taking an opportunity back in England. And if he'd have gone, he would have taken his whole coaching support team with him. What would have happened then? There would have been a massive void there. Where would have been the conveyor belt, a young potential coach, a potential next door to manager, working a little bit forward or down or around the senior mm. international group who would just naturally step in? You know what I mean? There wouldn't be that vast, jo- a big jolt in terms of the manager taking his whole management staff away with him. Where are those players around the senior international team, the likes of John O'Shea's, whoever they are, Damien uh, uh, Doves, Richard Dunn, wh- whoever they uh, may be, who are just ready to step in. It's almost a natural convert, but natural progression for people to step in, pick up the slack and move forward. Like I, I don't quite see that at the moment. It's talked about in some quarries. I don't see an awful lot of it spoken mm. about but that real um, uh, understanding of, yeah, we need to get players, we need to strengthen the team, but what about the coaching network uh, around that? I haven't spoken about in terms of some of the or, or uh, rugby players getting to the age of stepping in the uh, coaching capacity. Uh, you mean more around the, the international team, do you? Or yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so, around, this, uh, senior in, uh, the, around the senior inter- international team. I mean, there's lads doing some great jobs over in England. Mark Kendi uh, in the academy at uh, Manchester City, uh, Stephen Reid and Dean Coyley. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Lee Carsey. There's a number of the round courts. Fleming's back at Middlesbrough, They're getting great experience over the past uh, couple of years. So that's all great. But some, for some players, the, the commitment to club football isn't great in terms of your time, family. It doesn't quite work. Mm. You know, what about in, a number of these players actually, you know, getting hold and bring them across and integrating them into the setup over here? Now, that's an easy thing to say. And there has been a little bit of dip me tone in the under 19s. Keith Andrews. Uh, one or two others do for us uh, mm. on, on occasion, but a real commitment to bringing these players in. You know, you got to pay them accordingly as well. But I think the money's there. And when you look at the money in terms of around the senior international team, in terms of what's being paid there, for me, there's an argument there for bringing in a body of players over the next uh, couple of years. John's one of them, and integrating them into the setup over here. So when Martin does decide to step away, whether that's two or four years time, we've all we've got we've got some potential well, replacements. Even from an assistant coach point of view, that it doesn't you don't always have to move to that level. Just that there is some sort of a sign of progression, I guess. Of well, exactly. And, and that's and that's it's always going to be a limited pool. I mean, there's always going to be more people who obviously take the other route to try and you know get into coaching. At, you mentioned some of the names there, and Stephen Reid is another one who's obviously trying to cut their teeth at a level a level in England and sort sort of see where it takes them. I'm assuming that probably where he's at in his career, maybe where Stephen's at, and these kind of yeah. guys, that it's probably more about trying to get a club gig. That's yeah, but these been coached level. for a lot of years, these players. And it's not about necessarily the next door of man. Some of the players are coached, they're happy to be coached and not look for that big uh, uh, st- uh, step up. And it may well be the case, the next, we need to find the next manager. We may have to cast, um, you know, look a little bit forward to a field. But at least we'll have players in, in positions underneath them, in coaching positions, mm. can, can work around these people. So you have a, you have a, me- me- a measure of solidity there, like of, of, of continuance in terms of players around the squad. And one of these players might surprise you may actually be capable of stepping up and taking on the manager's job. You know, it, Roy's an obvious one, I won't uh, labour the point. I know that probably wasn't the plan in terms of Martin and his succession, uh, Roy coming in, but Martin steps away. There's an obvious succession there in terms of uh, uh, Roy yeah. stepping in there. No, that probably mm-hmm. wasn't the plan. But then what about below Roy? Who's coming through then? Who are the next potential players uh, who have to record skills, get to, to step up, and maybe Roy steps aside? Maybe that's a, that's a n- natural conversation there. Probably hasn't been had. May well never be had, like you know. But it's a shame, really, because I think we have some real talent on the coaching side as well as the playing side, and we're just not quite tapping into it at the moment. Yeah, um, we're going to get to the squad in just a second. Jason on Twitter saying that uh, about John O'Shea that he's not underappreciated by regular match-going fans for sure. Uh, maybe the bandwagon crowd uh, says Jason. There having a bit of a dig. Uh, we've had a few contacts in Kenny as well, just on our previous conversation about VAR. Some of them wondering specifically around the Thierry Henry handball incident is obviously the one that frequently crum- uh, comes to mind about... Um, He's already mentioned um, that he doesn't care about it, Thierry Henry. No, I, don't, I suffer. That, that's my point. I will, su- I, will, I will suck it all up. I've been at the... 
I've been suffering a few of myself uh, over the years, and it's an easy one. And I understand that. Oh, I would say we had the same. Because that, that one's black. That one's black. It's a black yeah. and white example. Yeah, but it's not. Yeah, what it is. Absolutely, there's plenty of them out there. But it's the bigger picture for me. It's not. Uh, I don't. I don't. I'm not feeling it. I'm really not. And I will suffer that in terms of those uh, those human errors that referees make. Uh, on a football pitch. I don't remember playing football in the kind of 80s and the 90s, even professionally when I went over to the advent of the Premier League and all that. These mistakes were still being made on a week-to-week -week basis. I don't remember this absolute uproar. Oh, the game's a shambles. How can we allow this to happen? Human errors costing us goal. People accepted it. They suck it up. Suck it up. It's part of the game. Let's the fact that you're even it. referring to them as mistakes, though, surely there's an opportunity no. to eradicate them. We should just take it. But it's it. not as simple as that, Adrian. I know you keep going back to your quote, people's default argument, but it's not, it's not the strongest because yeah, you will, you will get decisions better. It's absolute. There's no doubt about that. Mm. But it's the, it's the, it's the ripple effect of that in terms of how it's going to affect the game. And I think the game will fun, fundamentally change and it'll lean more towards an NFL style approach to the game in terms of dissecting every single decision that happens on a on a football pitch. And a lot, of, the, a lot of those decisions are dissected actually as the game goes on. So frequently, when VAR is functioning yeah. properly, it doesn't actually even impact. A lot of the time, people don't even know what's happening. No, no. It's, it's, in some cases, that will be the case. But there's so many contentious in, uh, um, episodes during the course of the game. Almost every 15, 20, 30 seconds, people have an argument. So that was a throw, and that must have been a free kick. Did you see that uh, 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 short pull? Was that offside? I don't know. Advantage to the, to the attacker? Oh, I'm not too sure. Was he interfering with play? Yes, he was. No, he wasn't. Of course he was. No, it's he only, wasn't. It's only in relation to the, to the scoring of, the act of scoring a goal. Ah, so at, the well, at the moment. At the moment. You're worried about the separation. So, so if they said to you, we're going to bring this in, we're going to ring fence the... I'm trying to get to your tipping point here, right? We're going to ring fence the... It's only... No it's tipping only, point. It's only uh, ever goal going line. to be in relation to goals. We've had the tipping it. point. Yeah, what, goal, what, do you what do you think about goal line technology? Yeah, goal, that's it. That's the tipping point for me. Goal line technology. That's it. Can I just say on, on your NFL reference there, I think that's a... F I just think that's an irrelevant point to make because of the nature of the sport. It's stop-start anyway. You've got to change your entire team while this decision is being made or potentially not. Like, that's the nature of the sport. I think football is unique. I think it's fundamentally different and to compare to NFL and... But I'm say, saying that's where it potentially could head. I'm not NFL, saying that's NFL, where it is. NFL isn't stop-start because of the officiating. To say that it, it will go the way of NFL and to say NFL is stop-start because of the officiating is just patently untrue. Well, I'm talking about, I don't, I don't want to see the game le le lengthened, fragmented, broken up. It's a fast-flowing uh, game, the game of football. That's the big attraction for people. That's where the exhilaration comes. We talk about a oh, high-energy game, up-tempos, energise the crowds, the atmosphere. That, that, this, this is what's driving it. The very nature of the game, the free-flowing nature of the game, back to front, counter-attacking, uh, that, that type of thing. You know, High-energy, uh, high high-intensity type of game. You start getting things. away from that. Well, for me, painfully, you can't. I've seen it already. I've seen it already this uh, this year round. That's it's just been the game's been killed. It's been absolutely killed. I'm looking at the telly, what, watching the game, thinking, well, I'll go and make a cup of tea. And probably half the people in the stadium are thinking that. Now, no, it's in the early stages. Oh, yeah, we can iron these things out. I don't see it. I really don't go down the road. And, and I'm seeing officials' behaviours change now. If I'm a linesman on the side now, seeing somebody in an offside position, I'm thinking, yeah, he's, oh, yeah, I'm sure he's offside. I'm going to put me up. I'll tell you what, no, I'm not. I'm going to keep me flagged down, even though I think it's offside, because... Then wait and see. Yeah, after. wait but and then see, doesn't let, that let actually, the VAR. Then doesn't that actually lend itself to a more flowing game? So he's, he's actually saying, well, I'm not sure, but it might be, but I'll keep my flag down, let oh, the game flow, God. and then we can review afterwards. That's actually... <laughs> that endorses your point about it being a more continuously flowing ga uh, game. No. No, no, not for me. So what happens, he, don't take, he, he doesn't put his flag, if the game goes on, mm. the man doesn't score. Yeah, so the game is continuing now. That yeah. should have been enough. So the game should have stopped. But uh, to your but point, it's, it's flowing. It's on we yeah, go. But not, not in those circumstances when it's flowing. But that's Why? all wrong. There should because have been. He's a, made a wrong decision. Should have been an, there should have been an offside there. But because of the VAR aspect, and he's thinking, I don't want to humiliate myself here. I don't want to be exposed to getting this decision wrong. I'm going to keep me flagged down. In fact, as often as I can, I'm going to. Keep, I'm not even going to officiate. Mm. I'm going to just run up and down. Oh, the Oh, that'd be the great. Line. The game would be perfectly flowing all the time. Yeah, but even wrong decisions that are being made, we're just going to accept it. But that's ridiculous. That's going. To, that's going to almost a farcical mm. proportions. Like, lawyers have got to realise they've got to be backed, and when they make a decision right or wrong. It's respected. Yeah, we all have our mouth up, but we'll get on, or we'll suck it up, and we'll get on.
I think we're going to have to agree to disagree oh, in this no, one. No. Come, back, come back in a year's time. Come, <laughs> let's have a conversation after the World Cup. Let's see how it goes then. Uh, the Ireland squad is the other thing we want to talk to you about. Uh, Martin Neal has named the squad for the upcoming how many? friendlies. 40, the I think. Is that the, am I right? 40? 40. Sort of, yeah. um, the main sort of uh, talking points here are in relation to the seven forwards that have been named. So Walters and Long are the... Obviously, uh, experienced heads here. Uh, Maguire, Hogan are the next tier. And then the new players, Aidan O'Brien from Millwall, Callum Robinson from Preston, and Graham Burke from uh, Sharmac Grovers. Uh, Martin Neal <coughs> was pretty honest, I suppose, yesterday on the state of his forwards, the dynamic of them, and what he has to deal with uh, for the upcoming campaigns. Are we, to a degree, without being <coughs> overly fatalistic about it, are we doomed here before we even begin? Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, a little bit too negative for me, as if, as if like, look, yeah, everyone is looking for that kind of natural goal score, that kind of fox in the box or whatever can kind of guarantee you a certain amount of goals, but goals can come from any area of the pitch, predominantly when you set up a team, and Martin's kind of jumped a little bit in terms of formation uh, during his time, but just your basic formation, which you see now played out week to week, that kind of say 4-3-3, a number nine, uh, uh, two wide, wide men in midfield three. It said Manchester City so well. Liverpool went out their best, the most dynamic, absolutely exhilarating. But the, the game nowadays, the modern game, it's about uh, goals being shared around the pitch. It's all about that front three. You know, the argument of your number nine hitting 30 goals or your two centre forwards need to get 40 goals between them. Your winger, your winger will chip in with a couple, maybe a goal scoring centre midfield. That's boy and boy now. You're looking at goals from all over that front line. That front three now mm. have to contribute. And the very best sides now, those wide players playing off the left and right, are contributing 15, 20 goals. And Salah's probably the very best, probably the exceptional. But most players in those positions now expect to get 10, 15 goals. Centre midfield players, particularly those advanced two number eights who have a licence to get forward. And I think we've got a couple of those players the likes of Jeff Hendrick uh, Conor Horahan at Aston Villa like scored a lot of goals uh, this season so when I think about wh where our goals are going to come from I'm not looking at that number 9 position with, with me blinkers on thinking have we got a natural goal score or no oh no there's have, no goals have we been, the, we've been doing that team. though haven't we? James I mean, McLean playing off yeah. the left hand side you know uh, top goal scorer in the, la the last qualifying campaign so for me it's not about we not we haven't got a Robbie Keane. No, we haven't got Robbie Keane. No, we didn't before he came. Mm. You know, we never will have a, another Robbie. Does that mean we're not capable of qualifying for major championships? No. It will tell you what. If we keep enough clean sheets during the course of the next qualifying campaign, we'll we'll qualify. Yeah. So let's concentrate as much on that. I think potentially we have goals. Look at that squad, and it's a huge, huge squad. I know. But the likes of Sean wouldn't give up on Sean Graham McGuire. Burke there, yeah. Yeah, she, yeah, Graham Burke, of course, yeah. Seems to be a very technically gifted player and um, has had a bit of a go in the UK. It didn't quite work out for him. Yeah, I'm interested. Gonna, yeah, I'm going to try well. the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I'm going to try and take in the game with the Rovers game. A couple of players that I'd like to have a look at uh, up close. Seen little bits of him on Scored on a belter TV. in front of O'Neill yeah. and Keane uh, on his weaker foot uh, yeah. last week, which I'm sure has done no harm in getting involved in that. Yeah, potentially, why not? Potentially a player that maybe given a shake. Yeah. Well, if you think he's good enough, the lads, uh, Roy Martin thinks he's got, got got the attributes. Yeah, this is the ideal time to bring him in. Even these League of Nations uh, games coming up, for me, the, 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 that's still an opportunity uh, to bring these players and mm. have a look at them in good in a good competitive environment. Some I've heard some people argue, well, it's only the France and. USA games, the only chance we'll have to look at players. Then it's yeah. like, watch the business starts in September. Well, no, not so much for me. If there's players that were real uh, quality and you really feel as if, yeah, hold on, these, pa these players are capable. They just need a little bit more experience in a real competitive environment. This League of Nations for me is probably, it's a halfway house for me in terms. It's not automatic qualification for the next major champions, but it's good competitive football. There's actually something at stake for the reasons you probably know better than me. So if the likes of Greenberg show up well and one or two others like Sean McGuire, the a couple of boys from Blackburn, whoever else, over the next um, two games, France and uh, USA. For me, keep them involved. It's not a case of, all right, take a step to the side for the next two years after the next qualifying campaign is over. Actually integrate them there during, uh, during the course of this League of Nations. And even over that period of time, by the time the qualifiers arrive uh, next March, one or two of those players may be capable of uh, stepping in. So in yesterday's squad, there are 10 players there who played Premier League football this season. I think only three of them have played over a don't get, don't get Look, I'm not going to jump, but don't get wound up. Don't get uh, set up on, oh, we've only got so many players playing at a certain uh, level. We haven't players playing at the league clubs. We've only got so many players playing at a uh, Premiership level. Oh, and but it look is at a gauge the though, isn't it? Yeah, it's a small fact, but it's only a small fact. Look at the individual attributes of those players first and foremost, regardless of where they're playing. And that's an exciting squad to me. Like I said, it's a huge squad, there's a lot of players in there. But some of the young talent in that squad as well, kind of Matt Doherty, uh, who's had an outstanding uh, uh, season. 
um, at Wolves. Even Greg Cunningham for me a couple of years ago looked as if he was the answer at left back. Had a couple of horrendous injuries. He's got his uh, career back on track uh, at Preston. Declan Royce uh, as well for me. In terms of the shape of the team, the likes of Declan coming in, Martin had a look at the back three. Potentially, could that be a way forward for us in terms of putting a system in place which best complements the players? A lot of talk about the system we set up against Denmark in the game at the Aviva, that kind of diamond shape in midfield, which really we got, we got, we got exposed. That was probably one of the reasons why we got beaten so heavily. So is there another system of play going forward which best complements these players? Kevin Long coming in, into the squad as well. Those attacking midfielders. Have we got goal scoring midfielders in mm. centre midfield? Yeah. So could we accommodate maybe a, a front three, maybe a lone central striker? What's the best uh, way to go for us going Going forward. Hopefully, Martin will find the answer to those questions going forward the next couple of months. And I know we need to get to a clip just to finish off my point there. What I was going to say was that we've got this amount of players who've proven themselves at the top tier to a certain extent. Most of them have proven themselves at that level. So what we, what my point is is that we're not quite sure how good some of these players can be. Of course, they can reach the top of the game potentially yeah. a couple of them. So what I was going to say is that when it comes to the next qualification campaign. I'm not fully sure if we're going to be guaranteed a playoff spot in our qualification campaign and therefore I am sure we need to be taking the League of Nations quite seriously at the end of this calendar year. Yeah, of course we take it seriously. I'm not talking about like throwing somebody and actually expose himself to you know, humiliation. The player need, clearly needs to have the right kind of skill set, the, men, the, men, uh, the, men, the mentality to actually go and step in. But there's always a, an element of risk uh, when you throw a young, young player in. No matter who they are in terms of will the hell they cope with the situation, the, the pressure on their shoulders. But you're only, you're only going to find out one way. And by and large, to me, those younger players you throw them in you get a bit of an inkling you look at them up close in the training camp you've seen them play at their, at, their, at their club level so you would have formed an opinion about them already maybe individually you would have met them as well so you get a bit of an inkling in terms of their kind of personality <coughs> character strengths but eventually you're going to make the decision I'm going to put them in mm, I'm yeah. going to back them even in, in a pressure I was the league of nation I know there's something at stake but this is all about player development this is what we have to do we have to develop our next core group of players sure, so we're going yeah. to have to take uh, these uh, small elements of risk one of those players who was developed, obviously, over the last campaign was Shane Duffy. He was on the Keith Andrews show yesterday talking about his role in the Irish setup. With my performance, because I feel like I've done, I've done steady. Obviously, I've had a few lows with Ireland, with the, obviously the sending off in the France game, and then I've had a bad moment in Moldova away where it's, it's a different feeling because you've your whole country sort of mm. on your back if you make a mistake or you're... So like when Do you feel that different pressure when you play yeah, for France? Of course, yeah, of course. 100%. I felt that after France, obviously, sort of came in against Italy, no one knew me, and the France game was such a big game for them. And then I felt so low after I felt like, oh, he probably doesn't trust me no more. And then I just sort of went back to where I was good at. And I've been lucky because I know the manager, I know what he likes, and it's sort of my game, and it helps me a lot. And but as you say, going in, like I always feel like I go in and it's my first squad. I feel like I go in and I have to impress him. And I know you sort of have this feeling where oh, he likes some and some. He always plays, but I always feel like I always it always rubs off me with Seamus. But Seamus always is on people, mm. and I always feel like I don't. You always say oh, you play, but you don't know. Mm. And I always go in like thinking, I hope I get an eye cap this trip, and and that's my outlet. And I think I can never change because I get too far ahead of myself, and I think oh, and then make the performances or my might drop and at that level it'll, it'll punish you and you see the likes of like John and Robbie and the ones who have over 100 caps you've got to stay at that level and, and be at that level if you want to get so far and that's my outlook every time I go away hopefully every squad I hope I'm in the squad yeah, that is uh, Shane Duffy. Does seem to have a <clears throat> long-term part in Martin O'Neill's plans. He was part of the Keith Andrews show yesterday. It's all up on YouTube. Stephen Reid was there as well. Uh, it's great stuff with both of those. It's live every Thursday from half past twelve. A couple of uh, talking points to bring your way, Kenny, before we wrap up in the football for the minute. Uh, Wayne Rooney to the MLS seems to be a bit of a thing. Um, a lot of the newspapers that almost brings a bit earlier on today suggesting that uh, he's going to essentially uh, sit it out with Big Sam and see oh. who's going <laughs> to. Who's going to crap themselves first and uh, get out of dodge? How I mean, do they decide that? I mean, is it like is it a game of tiddlywinks? Is I it think a game it's of, a like, game of Big Sam is probably going to get the boot it's anyway. Amazing. And so one of the hierarchy at Everton sort of sidles up and says, "Listen, Wayne, don't be too quick to uh, get yourself out of here." But this was pretty. But this was pretty obvious. He won a force head. He's been linked to a, a club in the US. Obviously, his relationship with Allardyce has deteriorated to an extent. I have a bit of sympathy for that, Allardyce. Uh, to be fair, I don't think Rooney is uh, his performance has merited. Um, automatic selection and this kind of perception that I'm a, I'm a central midfield player now you have to 
Uh, you have to integrate me to the team as I'm, I'm going to play a deeper role. I'm, my pass and range is set. I'm never quite bought into Rooney as a natural centre midfield player because he hasn't got too many defensive uh, uh, attributes in, in that area that it pitched for me. So, yeah, so I have a bit of sympathy for Allardyce in terms of how he's dealt with uh, Rooney, a bit of respect. I think he's been quite strong in terms of, look, you haven't been performing at a level, you're out in the team. He hasn't been pussyfooting around them. And I can understand Rooney and being not too happy with this. He thought he was going to be this kind of godlike figure coming back to Everton. But you are right. It looks as if <laughs> Wayne Rooney has basically just said to the Everton board, looks at the contract there for me, I can yeah. jump. But He's only 32, by the way. Like... Yeah, he's Robbie only 42. Robbie Keane was 34 when he went to uh, but in, Galaxy. In effect, he's about 43 in football in terms, really, in terms of his physical capabilities, his, his football and quality, his technical abilities. The amount of role he's, he's put behind him as well, in fairness, like, I mean, yeah. 17 years old. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, without a doubt. But in terms of what, what's going to happen there, it's a, yeah, it's amazing. If he was to jump and suddenly Allardyce was to get sacked the, the week after, the next manager was to come in and say, what oh, absolute shame Wayne Rooney went to went to the, uh, Washington, I would have I would have built this kind of team around them. So mm. I can understand. I would imagine Rooney's first uh, impulse is to stay. He made a big commitment to Evan there, boy, uh, boyhood club. So I would I would think he wants to stay. Clearly not under Allardyce's uh, tutelage. So that's a that's a that's a it's a decision for the board really. They're in the sticky position for me because they've got to, it looks as if they've got to make that decision and make it quick. And it's how much they value. Wayne Rooney, what they've seen of Wayne Rooney up close this season in terms of influence on the pitch and in the dressing room, surely that's going to uh, make their mind up uh, in terms of whether potentially Allardyce uh, stays or goes. For them, it'd be easy to back off, keep Allardyce in the job, almost let Rooney make the decision for them. Mm. They, they wouldn't get a lot of flack because of that. Well, they've Rooney made the decision uh, oh. to jump. They, they, they could go and get the manager in maybe yeah. another two or three weeks time and say, well, Wayne took it over hands. He would have loved from the stay. So a lot of politics come into this when you have a player such a big persona, a personality uh, like Wayne Rooney. But Allardyce would be chuckling to himself. I think he's a winner either way. Allardyce, <laughs> to yeah. be fair to you, whether he comes or goes. Absolutely. Um, right, uh, we're going to leave the football there for the uh, for the minute. We've some good GA stuff uh, to come your way in the next few minutes. Do keep your ca- uh, questions and comments coming in to uh, Kenny. There's been everything, Kenny, from the... Uh, Kenny got out of the wrong be- uh, side of bed this morning. Kenny needs a bit of a... Forget about decaf coffee, give him a full strength to... Uh, Kenny's a bit of a legend, and uh, people really enjoying what you have to say. I don't know why would they, full, why would they the think full that. The full gamut. <laughs> like what? what are the legend attributes you've Adrian's you've pushing me? this I fell out of bed at the, the wrong side of the bed this morning I'm not happy with that I'm just, you, I'm I'm just relaying what people are, much a personal, what people are getting personal into personal opinion personal view uh, pushing uh, Kenny Cunningham future Irish manager says Andy Dunleavy there on the old Facebook machine Kenny in great form legend hashtag OTBAM says Simon John Whelan and if, uh, Simon John says it, it must be true, so congratulations. Oh, that'd be, that'd be, that'd be, what's our population at the moment? What's the, what's the population? Five-ish, what? is it? Five, Five million. million, that's yeah. two. Well, this <laughs> reason be Sounds like Kenny wants to coach me in the international so. setup. says, where's Kenny there? No, I've been there, well, thankfully I've been there. I've had a, I've, I've had a taste through there on the 19s last year, it was great. I did enjoy it, it was wonderful. That's what I'm saying, there's some great talent there. And I, 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 I'm, until you're exposed to it, you see it. Hear a lot of people say, oh, where's the next young players? Even some analysts, oh, we've no, where's the next young player? We haven't mm. got the young player. We're not playing at the highest level. So you go get down and watch the under-19s, 17s, 19s, 21s play. You'll see the talent pool there. It's not a given these players are going to step up. Still a big jump above their own for a lot of different reasons in terms of whether they're going to take the step up uh, at club and international level. But the talent at that level is absolutely frightening. It absolutely bowled me away when I was around it. Well, they're obviously holding their own, which is always encouraging. I mean, once you start to think that Ireland at a senior level are starting to negotiate the steps down the stairs to, towards more mediocrity, you start to get a little bit worried. But there is a bit of hope in these young Ireland teams and some of the performances, oh, is, individual oh. performances for sure. Yeah. It's just a pathway, getting a pathway for these players to get the type of experience necessary and just game time under the belt at the required level that they need to develop and progress. That's just a natural thing. That's always been the case. It was there for me as a young, so not quite so easy for the young players. But just get out, get out, get an opportunity to get around them around the country when, when their underage teams are playing. Get out, bring the kids and have a look. Have a look at the quality of footballers that we have at that level. I can promise mm. you it'll blow you away. Right, we have a world exclusive, uh, Kenny, coming the way of our audience right now. A lot of people probably on the way into the office there, but... Uh, 
uh, sort of two minutes before the work day begins. But That's unprofessional. We're speaking Mal and Quinn being unprofessional. You don't arrive into I work did. two minutes before, <laughs> do you? I did. Well, how, you were here about Mom. two minutes before we went out here this morning. <laughs> so, you know. God, a taxi was late. Taxi was uh, late. But I'd encourage you to uh, sit tight for the next few minutes and uh, check this one out. Uh, we're going to be putting it up on our social channels afterwards, but it's uh, an exclusive mini-doc that uh, Off The Ball Productions has made in association uh, with our friends at Vodafone. We shot uh, outside Glasson Village uh, in Athlone at the uh, Three Jolly Pigeons pub. Uh, you get about 20 people into it and it's pretty jammed at that point. Uh, it's a pretty cool location. It's another side to Robbie Henshaw is the essence of what this is uh, It's all about. It's uh, uh, all about his introduction to music at a very young age by his dad and by his granddad. His family are steeped in music. They're steeped in uh, Athlone heritage as well. Uh, the whole family are, are very talented and uh, Robbie brought most of them along. Uh, to this day, Sharon Shannon is also involved uh, and uh, Robbie and Sharon are going to cut a CD, I think a bit later in the year, uh, with all proceeds of that going to the Athlone Hospice. You can check out southwestmeathhospice.ie or check them out on um, Facebook as well, doing lots of uh, lots of good work, so do check them out and support if possible. Uh, it's all in association with Vodafone and the Team of Us campaign. This is an Off The Ball exclusive. Here you go. First thing was was music because he he started the, about the age of five, right? I think yeah. you. I was more yeah. nervous doing that now than I was going out for for a game. Time. You know, music was kind of at the heart of that, where it kind of kept us all all together, I suppose, and all all in at alone as well. So. I started this man here on the prison. And on the accordion. Yeah, you whistled yeah. into my ear, didn't you? That was so. <laughs> <laughs> and I tried to he copy taught, back. He was taught to Billy Henshaw. Yeah, I, I Billy. whistled everything. Yeah. Whistled everything, yeah. And my father taught me to fiddle at eight. No, he didn't know how to play it either, but he taught me it. Figure that out. <laughs> you know, I should have taken out some kind of a pattern on it. I could have made money out of that. <laughs> Obviously, we've a, a big family, and it kind of keep kept us close to our cousins as well, because we'd always, um, you know, anytime we'd meet up, we'd always, you know, have sessions and stuff. So I think music was kind of at the heart of that, where it kind of kept us all, all together, I suppose, and all, all in Athlone as well. So my father, he was from Dublin, and he was from a family of kind of musicians, and I suppose I got a bit of that from him. Robbie got a bit of that down through Tony and I. We love him to bits in my case. It's as simple as that. He started with the yeah. fiddle and then all of a sudden hit an accordion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. Mm. It's great. And Emily, you were the same. You started yeah. with. What, what did you start with? The fiddle, fiddle. as well? Yeah. And then you moved on to the. Yeah, I sent the fiddle. Then I moved on to the. Bit of a dancing as well. I could go on to <laughs> Oh, yeah. Rob used to play in the kitchen, Dad would be playing the guitar, and I'd be practicing my jigs or, you know, feet like fireworks. Yeah. <laughs> I was never any good, but he used to tell me I was brilliant. Keep yeah. going. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, whenever we went away, like, we. Yeah. D Granddad always told us. <laughs> yeah, his famous words. He's like, Yeah. Uh, I suppose it, wherever you go, make sure you bring, you bring your, your instruments. Bring your instruments, you yeah. never, what did he say? You'll never be out of pocket. You'll always meet <laughs> yeah. someone. You'll always meet people Loping and up doors for you. Reminds me a lot of my of my own family. Like it was just music, completely mm -hmm. focused on the music the whole time, and and it's it's fantastic yeah. for 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 the whole family. And um, yeah. like one of the girls was saying, it, the, the the love for it is what yeah. what keeps what keeps you, mm. um, you know, keep, keeps it up really. Yeah. 
his first start was on the set you were seven, I think. He was seven uh, when he first started playing rugby. Yeah. Um, yeah. Box. Yeah, 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 under seven. Yeah, yeah. And dad was coaching me and he used to be out in the garden with me holding <laughs> a fender and he'd, he'd be practicing it as his, his side steps. <laughs> yeah, we lived in the now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was only young back then, but yeah. I was the one who was standing, or he'd be kicking. I never the ball. tackled you though. No. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I could have. Yeah, yeah. I remember that those early sessions. We'd sit them down there in the circle. We'd be all from three, four, five, eight, nine years of age, the whole lot, of, and the scratching and scraping that come out of it. You <laughs> <laughs> drive the crowd nearly out of the place. <laughs> Some young kids can show huge talent early on and fade away, but you you just seem to peak at the right time, Robbie. Yeah, yeah. Held it right. <laughs> and then from there you just progressed. But he's not finished yet. <laughs> There you go, uh, an Off The Ball exclusive production down in Glasson, just outside Glasson Village in Athlone and uh, huge thanks to the Henshaw family for coming along and for Sharon Shannon as well as that it's all uh, in partnership with Vodafone and uh, they will be cutting a CD a bit later in the year. It's all uh, with uh, support of the Athlone Hospice. You can check out southwestmeathhospice.ie for more details on all of that. But uh, the vibe of that, Kenny, you were enjoying oh, it. It's, it was, it's the antidote to, we spoke at the top of the show about your model and music. <sighs> it's the antidote to that, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's not. I wouldn't say it's quite uh, typical. I mean, that'd be quite unusual in terms of the different generations. A great picture there, Robbie, his dad and his uh, his granddad. There, his uncle together. and his granddad. Oh, so yeah, excuse yeah. me. Yeah, I mean, it's that's a that's a wonderful picture and just takes me back again. It, we're quite unique, I think, in terms of as a nation. I mean, obviously when we came together as a squad, even when the squads evolved and changed over a couple of years, players come in and come out. But that was pretty much a constant in terms of even the music around the, the squad. I'm sure it's the same with the, the rugby lads. And we had a few lads who played instrument. Uh, Andy Reid, who you probably know, yeah. is, is a very ac accomplished uh, musician. Uh, Alan Lee, and mostly guitar. But just the sing song, the, the getting this, the music actually pulling everything together. Noel O'Reilly, Brian's number two, of course, uh, loved his music. And even Brian went a bit forward or failed, just mentioned to you there. Uh, at times when Brian was in charge, he arranged for like uh, Aslam, Paul Brady came and set up, right. set up all the equipment at a hotel in Paul Marnock, and we'd all come down together. Brian's as a big group. into his music. Yeah, yeah, but that was kind of yeah, really pulled pulled everything together. So it's always been part of it. The little sing songs out, the lads out late night out around the table, sing songs. You know, maybe no musical instruments, not as talented as Robbie there and his family, but somebody had started off, and that was always it's always been a kind of part of it, and I think it's. We kind of stand alone in that respect. It might be other nations, of course, around the world. I'm sure that's part of music, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for us in particular, I think that's always really pulled pulled us together mm. uh, yeah. as a group. And the connection that it's like it's pretty evident from that. The connection that the music gives the Henshaw family that opportunity to they talk about this secret session that they have in that pub once a year. They don't sort of tell anybody about it. As I said, the pub you get about twenty people into it and it's jam packed. They just rock up have the session and it's clear that that's the sort of thing that as Irish people we kind of use in a lot of ways to yeah. we talk about sport or we play music and we sort of connect with each other in that way. It's great to even you walk into a pub anywhere, I'm not, not a big travel, I haven't been a big travel around Ireland but you know that you know, walking into a village pub or kicking the door open hearing that little bit of music wherever it is, wherever the instrument is, fiddle, I'm a big um, I listen to what the Fiori's now, uh, would listen to a lot of them uh, growing up, and it's the, the small little get the man the mandolin for me is mm. prob probably. Do you the play one. anything? No, I don't use this. Absolutely. Did you ever it, try? No, I, I didn't really. To be honest with you, no, I, I never felt never felt comfortable. Never really had the skill set. Even listening to Robbie talk there, the instrument getting put mm. in his hand. I know his uncle was saying a bit of a scratching going on, but but generally speaking, I think you're kind of drawn to those 
type of instruments. It's almost like a, a natural thing. So, but I love being around it. I have a huge amount of respect for people who can play the talent. You know, just pick up an yeah. instrument and, and play. I would have listened to a lot of as we all did, uh, kind of growing up, that kind of folk, folk music from a lot of different people. But it's great. Uh, great, just, great to see it. Yeah, we hope to be able to bring a bit more of it as well uh, over the coming weeks. With one comment in there, we might get it back up on screen from uh, the great Jimmy Allen, who talks about the great sessions that they would have had out in uh, Coosin Point, as Jimmy says, uh, down the years. Billy Senior and his dad had a band for years. Uh, there we go, Jimmy Allen. Uh, Related to Foster and Allen. Wow. Actually related to Foster and Allen. That isn't just uh, something I've plucked off the top of my head. Coached me Gaelic football, Jimmy, for years. That's why I've ended up uh, the, uh, the great <laughs> athlete that I am today. Media. <laughs> was that a, a little, what, the video we just watched, was that, was that a little sample of your adolescence in Westmeath, going bar hopping, getting sessions in here and there? Uh, not particularly. I bought, um, no, not at all. <laughs> I bought, um, I can't think of the wor right name for it, but it's like an accordion. Um, the name escapes me about six months ago with the express right. uh, intent. What, what is it? Squ no, not a squeeze box, no. Um, the production team are on fire this morning, Kenny. Uh, <laughs> help me, help me! <laughs> It'll come to me. In a See, bought, you had both? I picked up, a, I got a thing, I, would, I said I listened to a lot of. Um, it's a funny thing, isn't it? When I was probably growing up in Dublin, didn't listen to a huge amount of Irish kind of folk, whatever, but of mm. course made a jump over to England. All of a sudden, you're kind of, you know, you're drawn to it, even in terms of. Irish books, history, that type of thing. It's so strange when you kind of separate yourself from a go to a different country, you're almost uh, drawn to it. But I would I saw Christy Moore, would listen to a lot of Christy Moore, would have seen him play quite a bit over the, uh, the UK and the Dublin and stuff with the bear on. When Christy used to set up on stage with the bear, I remember seeing him in a Hammersmith yeah. a few uh, times, silence in the room. And he started banging Brilliant, away at yeah. that. And you were talking about, did you ever try? I thought, yeah, I'll have a crack at that. Yeah, yeah. So I pick, remember picking up a bear on once, I was, in, I was in Galway at some point, holidaying down there picking up a bear on, had a nice thing, a mural on it, the kind of four provinces, and remember, bring it back to the UK, and <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> They're looking you, at you, you can get, so far. You can get so far, can't you, with it? You it know looks what I mean? easy, but then, it's, it's certainly right up there in terms of the things that look easy, but are actually very, very yeah, difficult. But, but an instrument like that, uh, Owen, in a, in a big venue, Hammersmith, I don't know, oh, yeah. six, it's seven, eight, and these, with a thing like that, and you think, oh, that's class. not going to travel, yeah. that's going to get... Well, I've learned to play Frere Jacques, Kenny, on the uh, accordion type instrument that I can't quite remember the name of. That's as far as I got. <laughs> <laughs> that's a betrayal to your country that that would be the first song that you learn. It's easy, Owen. That's the uh, secret. <laughs> Forget about betrayals. It's easy. That's the uh, short story. Right, so that'll be going up on our social channels, so you can check it out over the next uh, little while as well. Uh, tonight, by the way, I do want to remind you that uh, Off the Bench are going to take over Off the Ball with thanks to Lidl, who are proud sponsors of the LGFA hashtag Serious Sport. Uh, presenter Clean Foley is going to be joined by Ashling Tarpey, Shana Cook and Sinead Green. Uh, it's from 8 o'clock. It's live on Off The Ball on News Talk. It becomes Off The Bench uh, for the evening and on Off The Ball channels as well. It'll be on YouTube, Twitter and Facebook too. So check out all of that good stuff coming your way this evening. Uh, he's across some of the newspapers this morning talking football. But next Tuesday on OTB AM we're bringing you a half hour special. A uh, very special with the Dublin footballer Michael Darren McCauley. It's absolutely brilliant. Here's a short uh, snippet of it. It's great, isn't it? Like, the, like someone sent me a photo of uh, of CP3 and the boys. Uh, yes, did you see them? They were looking fresh. They were <laughs> looking fresh. They're all all wearing all wearing the the, the hats and the multi odds. Like I'm, yeah, I was taking out. Uh, so yeah. I'm going to be walking out of a, yeah, a, a you, Leinster quarterfinal now. <laughs> we, we need to start doing that when the bus pulls up in Croke Park. That you know, there's so, like, like, that should be so loud. How much more interesting would that be like, if we're allowed to wear our own gear and then we have our gear set up, walk in in our like, badass suits and stuff? Like. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm well up for that. Like. Never going to happen, though. It's never going to happen because we have to wear O'Neill's till the day we die. Yeah. Or just tell the bus driver to stop 200 yards earlier and just get out of the bus earlier and, I don't know, just, just make an eye contact with the camera or something. I do, do something that's not fashion-based. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. There's definitely an idea there. And uh, we, we need to spread our wings to everyone. Every, like, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Ridiculous, like, that everyone, everyone is wearing the same tracksuit. Like, like, do you know what I mean? Like, let's, yeah. get, let's get a bit of identity about this. We're not trying to be fashion queens. Like, it's just like, come on, come on, let's, let's, let's open Seriously, up. Seriously, I, like, I agree with you. Right? And I do think that there's, uh, like, a... Uh, a weird Irish cultural fear of anybody showing change, a sign of difference. It's 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 like, it's yeah, it's like it's it's really kind of autistic in the way they hate change. Like it's it's and it's so, I don't I don't say backwards. It's so like, but it's just the cogs of the GA often move so slowly, and so people are afraid of losing their their little grasp of power. That it's nothing changes, nothing changes, and like I know, like, and there is a lot of forward-thinking people, um, and but it's just, yeah, like just certain things that like, 
like, like I, th I think one of the, one of the biggest gripes to me is how the game is marketed. Like, like, like I, I, I use the I use the example of like, like you don't need to like Gaelic football to enjoy a match, but I, I think you do. I like, I think you do. Like, if you don't if you don't enjoy Gaelic football, you should still be able to come and enjoy the performance that is put on, the show that is put on. Like, I went to we went to a basketball game, went to a Celtics game with a girlfriend, and like she, she couldn't spell basketball. She had no interest, like literally no interest. And we were like up in the bleachers, like there were crap seats, and yeah. they were like. She like had the best time ever. Like she was able to go in, like get her like hot dogs and nachos. Music came on. They shut down the lights in the crowd. Everyone came out with this big like handshakes. Like s steam came up as they as they ran out. Um, they all like half time came. They all fired T-shirts up. Like and she was like some throb the experience. She couldn't tell you if you paid her who won. Like no interest, but she had a great experience. Yeah. I think that needs to be brought into GA in a big way. Like I think we need a set experience. Like like I, I had to like. I like I remember like we brought like a a lot of foreign people to a game last year like and then like it was just it wasn't a great game like and then you had to apologize to them I was like that wasn't that wasn't good enough that wasn't a good performance like yeah like like t half time of the All Ireland final do you know what I mean like that should be like a show piece I, yeah. I, 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 like we don't have to go full Homer Simpson on it and like and and fill it with, with water and and you know what I mean but like you can put on like more than more than like just a like a bear on a stage or like or like do you know what I mean like let's yeah. let's let's go at it like is that is that a fair point. I think it's a pretty fair point. We're back to the Bowerons again. Everything Michael Darren McCauley, it uh, turns out, says is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, you're good at tar. I liked his... Uh, you were having that, were you? Yeah, yeah, he raised the bar big time. Big time. I think he's right that there's too many... It's like a sport that... Um, there's a lot of sheep in it. It's kind of... It's difficult to be somebody who's not... Like, I mean, there was yeah. the Darren McCauley thing last year of... He came out for the warm up for the All Ireland final, and he had cut the uh, sleeves off his shirt, and this was like the most rebellious thing that's ever been done. As opposed to like, ultimately, who really cares about it? Yeah, I'm not quite immersed enough in the GA to start kind of pontificating all this thing, pointing the finger. But <coughs> but the general point that he's making in terms of making a real occasion for people who are torn up, I yeah, I think there's value to to a point. Mm. To a point, I look at some of the American sports, and I cringe a little bit. It can be a little bit over the top, but I think there's certainly a that happy medium there, and I think there's obvious uh, uh, times during the game, obviously pre-match, the half time, etc., where certainly we could kind of energy that kind of energy, get real energy yeah. inside inside the stadium, and yeah, make it more of a spectacle for those people who are paying good money uh, to come and uh, to come and watch the game. So yeah, I think it is a fair point in general what he's saying. There is a sense of insecurity about Gaelic games, though, isn't there? Like I can co completely relate with his. Uh, words there about bringing somebody who's not from Ireland to a Gaelic football game and having to kind of be apologetic about it if it's not a good enough game. I mean, I can completely relate with that. I mean, like we, we can give out all we want about the GA and not wanting to take that step forward, but I think we're all insecure in our own little way about our national games, no? Yeah. I, I like the traditional aspect of our, our games. Like I said, I think it's quite distinct, unique, particularly the, 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 the GA uh, and the Horland. So I certainly wouldn't want to deviate away too much from that but like I said there, I think there is a happy medium there yeah but well, I think Amy, attendances you know I mean? are down slightly and like I mean obviously there's everything that's going on with the broadcasting thing I think like ultimately at some point it's got to move on like it can't yeah. always be you're talking about the sort of tight relationship we have with tradition I think maybe is the uh, essence of that like at some point we're going to have to move on like GEA is not going to we've had all these conversations but what does the GEA look like in 2034 like Gaelic not, League is a thing of the past basically yeah well I mean it's, yeah, it's not going to look like it does now yeah. so it's going to have to move on at some point uh, more Bowerons is the um, main thing I'm taking from Today's show, Kenny, there can't be a bad mandolin. thing. Mandolins, round to mandolins is the way forward. Uh, OTB AM is brought to you this morning with AIR, the home of AIR Sports. You can get amazing live sporting content free with AIR Broadband. Uh, it is a quarter past, just gone a quarter past nine on this uh, Friday morning. The Mayo Galway game this weekend, we've sending our best team to uh, Mikhail Park for this one, uh, Kenny. Uh, James Horn is going to be there reporting on it, so um, the teams have been named on. I think there's anybody else. Down there? No, just interest. James Warren. De yeah. Definitely not me. Uh, Owen Shane is going to be down there as well. He uh, is going to take on Mayo Galway first. Mikel Parker. You can see the teams on your uh, screen there. So both of them have named uh, their teams debutants uh, on both sides. If the selections indeed are to be believed, ten of the Mayo team who started the uh, 2017 All Ireland will start again. Loftus, Dermot O'Connor, and Ono Dunne who are among the young blood coming in. Uh, Owen, I mean, I don't know if these are the teams that are going to start, but. Maybe that's exactly what this Mayo team needs, is that little bit of an injection of quality. The Loftus and O'Connor, we know a little bit about, and Ona Dunne, who was an under-21 uh, winner, I think, in 2016 with Mayo. So, I mean, maybe that's the, the grain of sand that Paddy would have spoke about. 
Well, O'Donoghue's class. We all know that. I mean, he was unbelievable. He scored the equaliser, the, the point to bring him back to within one against Donegal in the last eight league, if I recall. But he was brilliant mm. before that as well. As an, he's an exceptional defender. But that's not the problem with Mayo. I mean, it's the age-old problem of needing uh, a new breed of energy in the forwards. And I mean, Conor Loftus, is he going to be that guy? Potentially. He absolutely could be. We haven't seen it from him yet. And I mean, if that's the starting team, then you'd imagine it's the perfect occasion for somebody like Conor Loftus to step up because you look at the players around him, you look at the Killian O'Connors, you look at the Dermot O'Connors, you look at the Aidan O'Shea's. I mean, there is a lack of pressure on him in that sort of environment. Whereas I don't think the league is a fair... Uh, environment to gauge anybody, let alone these young players, because they come in there and they're usually one of about three novices in, in the starting team, quite often, especially early days in the league, and it's like, right, these guys aren't up to it at all. Whereas, you look at Dublin in the league, and they bring in the likes of Brian Howard and, and Niall Scully last year, and it's just one at a time, and they're, they've got their hand held to a certain extent, where older players are, are taking a little bit more of the flack. I mean, the best defender is going to be marking uh, some of the older players, and I think that could be the case for Loftus on Sunday. I think it could be a breakout championship performance for him, something that may desperately need. Yeah, and maybe a breakthrough for Galway this year. It feels as if they kind of need it. I mean, they obviously did one on Mayo last year before coming to Cropper in the, uh, the Connick final. Um, we can see their team there on uh, on screen, but feels to be a big enough year. I mean, I don't know. I've, I've seen but he some... shouted up Galway. I was having a conversation with somebody a couple of weeks ago in Dublin, uh, yeah. got onto the GA, and they shouted up uh, Galway, dark horses. And he yeah. to it. I don't know. I mean, I've seen some people make the case that um, they should have All-Ireland ambitions this year. I don't know if... Uh, a final should be an ambition for, for Galway, but I mean, it does feel as if they do, they do need to make a step forward. Um, I, I, I agree with Tomas O'Shea there and Cook. I was very surprised to see Peter Cook left out of the team. Yeah, but again, who knows? Yeah, I mean, why are we talking about a I team? Know, she, what know, the hell know, am I, I doing let's, here? Let's, I let's, make, let's make a rule that we never do that. I know, it's, uh, I have uh, fell into that trap right away. Uh, it's hard not to know because of the hype around it. Peter Cook would probably play a huge part in the game at some point, whether it's like half an hour or whether it's 70 minutes, who knows. Uh, he'll probably start says Tommy in my ear, and I couldn't. I could probably agree with him on that. I've got a feeling that or I've I've tried to kind of take a step back from this game a little bit over the past Our twenty four hours, forty eight hours, yeah. because yeah, like everybody's been so excited about this for the last three months, and I, I I've had to take a step back and say, listen, it might not live up to the hype. And after just looking at the teams yesterday, I'm like, screw that. This is going to be an amazing game. Even if it's not the most high-scoring game of all time, <laughs> Galway, I guarantee you, are going to be the team that we grow to despise this summer. And that is why they are going to succeed. We are going to hate them come the end of the why? summer. Just be strong words there. Yeah. I know, I, uh, it is. Why? But we're going to despise them in the way that we, some people may despise the Tyrone and Armagh teams uh, of early on this century. They, they're not going to give Mayo any respect on Sunday. That is why they've got a very, very good chance of winning this game. Why I think they will win this game on Sunday. That the pulling and dragging that we saw on the the league between Mayo and Galway, which was at times instigated by Galway, is going to be nothing compared to this Sunday. People, people are trying to downplay this game all of a sudden this week. Don't downplay this game. It's going to be one of the highlights of May. I'm so Kenny. Yeah, yeah. Good no, enough for I'll me. Buy into that. Yeah, it's a good sell. Good sell. Kenny, an absolute pleasure as always. Thanks, William, yeah. for coming into us. Cheers, we lads, had yeah. our differences over the last uh, hour and a bit, but I think we can. Oh, yeah, it's all yeah. personal. Yeah. It's all yeah. personal. Yeah. Purely, <laughs> purely professional. We think we can all agree that time spent in Kenny's company is time well spent. Thanks, William, for coming in. Owen, enjoy your uh, weekend. Thank you very much. Enjoy yours. Yeah, Mikhail Park. Go play your Frere Jacques. I know, I need to, I need, do need to sorry, get back into playing a little dun, bit more of that. No, that's not it, Kenny. That's not it. I don't know what that, that is. It is, it is, it yeah. No, 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 it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. Well, that's, that's, a maudlin, that's a maudlin version of it. <laughs> 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 the Hurling Show, a uh, brand new offering from Off the Ball is coming your way from half past 12 uh, today. It's a new lunchtime offering. It'll be every Friday during the summer. Uh, summer. Shane Stapleton will be in this very seat. Uh, Michael Verney will join him today to look ahead to uh, the weekend's hurling. Uh, off the Ball returns to the radio tonight as always from 7 o'clock as mentioned a bit earlier uh, the off the bench uh, takeover of off the ball starts from 8 this evening and this weekend across off the ball we're going to have uh, full and exclusive live commentary of the Champions Cup final Dave will be in Bilbao and he's going to be joined by Keith Wood and Liam Toland for commentary of that Tommy Walsh you need more Tommy Walsh in your life and he's going to be at Dublin Kilkenny uh, today you should read Jackie Turrell's piece in the Irish Times by way of a preview for that one by the way that will be up on the Dublin dressing room I've no doubt about that uh, James Horan and somebody else is going to be at the uh, Mayo Galway game on Sunday as well reporting in to the show uh, Nathan is at Chelsea Newcastle we had to do a game this weekend and uh, <laughs> listen <laughs> there's nothing riding on any of these too much um, so that's the game that's going to be on uh, News Talk and then over on Today FM on Premier League Live. It's a marquee day, a huge day for uh, one Ron Jones who will do his final commentary 
on uh, Premier League Live after a long number of years. So we look forward to cel celebrating that in the company of Ron. And Brian Kerr, who, as so often uh, has been, will be by his side to uh, lead him through Liverpool against Brighton. So that's pretty much it uh, from us for this morning. Before we go, though, we want to leave you with this. Uh, Fanta Sandstorm is back with a bang for 2018, inviting the most adventurous thrill-seekers across Ireland to test their limits on the five-kilometre beach run. Fanta Sandstorm will take place at Dublin's Dollymount Strand. It's on June the 9th and uh, carries Ballyhigh Beach uh, on July the 14th. Uh, tickets will be uh, on sale from Monday the 14th of May. So Owen managed to squeeze in another, yet another, Kerry Lovin uh, on the show. Here's his chat with the former Kerry goalkeeper and the current Offaly coach, Brendan Keeley. Enjoy. All right, delighted to say Brendan Keeley joins me in studio now. Brendan, a uh, very good afternoon to, afternoon to you. How are things? How are you doing? All good, thanks. Uh, congratulations, I guess is where we start. Uh, people might not know, but Kilcommon had a very good win at the weekend in the Kerry Intermediate Championship, back up to senior level straight away. We did, we did, yeah. yeah. We got relegated from senior for the first time in over 20 years there, about six months ago, and played the Intermediate Final on Sunday, and yeah, thankfully came out the right side before, so we're delighted. Mm. Still playing, obviously, obviously in the club capacity. It's, I, I guess, when you look at the weather last weekend and you see some great championship matches, particularly in New York. Uh, I wonder, is there part of you thinking you'd love to be putting on the Kerry jersey again this year? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like you know, I, I think no matter what age you are, or whatever, you'll always miss the big championship days. You know, that's what it's all about. That's what that's why you start playing football. But um, no, I've loved getting back involved with the club this year, given getting you know stuck in 100 percent there and. Thankfully, it's after paying off so far, even though it's still early in the year, you know, the way the championship is this year. So, uh, no, just enjoying my football now, yeah. I was going to ask, what have you been getting up to with all the free time since you're not an inter-county footballer anymore? But it's, it's pretty obvious, I mean, you've gone straight into inter-county coaching. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think my wife would tell you there's much free time now still, <laughs> anyway. But, um, yeah, I, the opportunity came along with Offaly there over the winter. Um, to start working with the goalkeepers up there as the, the goalkeeper coach and it's something I've always enjoyed doing the, the goalkeeper work myself and also the coach inside of it so um, yeah look I, I jumped at it my mother's from Offaly as well so there was strong family ties and yeah yeah we're, we've championship coming up now and just enjoying the journey now and yeah, getting stuck into the Leinster Championship for a change. Yeah, absolutely. We'll get into that yeah. in just a moment. But I just want to start with last year for the time being. So I don't think we've actually had you on the show uh, since last year because it, it, I think it came out of the blue for a lot of people, you leaving the Kerry panel last year. Like, what, what was the whole decision behind that? Yeah, I suppose, look, it was, um, it, it was, it was just time and I just felt like it was the right time, you know. Um, and look, that, that, was, that was last year, you know. I, I'm conscious now that, that Kerry are preparing now for, for the 2018 championship, you know, and uh, that type of thing. So that was just a decision I came to last year. And yeah, for, for a lot of people, maybe the timing might have been a bit strange, but just in my own head, the, the, the timing was, was right for, for all, you know, so, hmm. yeah. It, it, look, cause I was just trying to rack my brains about who are the other all-stars in the country who've actually retired before, well, I wouldn't say retired, you stepped away, um, before, say, age is caught up with them or before a serious injury. And I, I would hazard a guess that you're potentially the only person in the country with an all-star who, who decided voluntarily to step away from inter-county football. Yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't thought about that. Um, I don't know, personally, I, I wouldn't be one for just, I don't know, looking to see what's been done before and following suit. That was just, sure. it was just something in my, in my own head. And look, it's, it's the way I wanted to go. And yeah, that's the way it's panned out, so... Whether it's the first or not the first, I'm not too sure. <laughs> I'm sure you look back on your time with Kerry with huge fondness, though. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, Jeez, yeah, I loved it, sure. Like that's that, that's why we all started playing down there, you know, is, is to get to the big days, to get to all our finals and stuff like that, and uh, to put on the Kerry jersey in general, like you know, a huge honour, a huge privilege, and something that was never taken for granted at all, you know. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's only it's only a good memories you look back on it all. Mm. And I'm sure it's something you're very proud of because of the whole transition. Everybody talked about transition. I think uh, the, the conveyor belt is certainly something that nobody will forget after Kieran Donaghy's uh, initial post-match speech in 2014 that essentially this was a brand new team that had gone a number of years without winning in All-Ireland and then 2014 arrives and you managed to get Sam Maguire back to Kerry. Like, it's, it'd be stupid of me to ask for a highlight because I presume that year in 2014, although the following year you get an All-Star, are, are surely kind of a 24-month period there where things are very, very rosy in your own footballing career. Yeah, yeah, that was obviously one of the, one of the highlights, yeah. Um, do you know, you, you look back different days, like the, the Munster final days were all as big days as well, uh, especially in Killarney, you know, big occasions, and um, big crowds and all is a good game as well. Um, so it's it, it's hard to pick out one, but yeah, I suppose like that period you mentioned there was sweet because I suppose there wasn't a whole lot expected of the team around that time. The talk, 
you know, is that we're on the wind, you know, there's, there's not much expectation at all. And then to, to come out and do what we did, I suppose, made it all the sweeter, you know, and um, I suppose, you know, you, you can never really write a Kerry team off. That's what, it, that's, what it, that's what it showed to a lot of people, I suppose. And it's remarkable as well when you talk about people writing Kerry teams off. Yeah, we can always uh, talk about Joe Brawley and people like that, but quite often it's people within the county as well. Yeah, well, I, I suppose like it's one of the, the drivers of, of success down there as well. Like there is expectation, mm. and um, nothing but the best is accepted, which I, I suppose overall is a good thing. You know, it, it has to be managed as well, but um, and dealt with. But uh, I think it, it'd be a worse sign of things if there was no expectation around the place and people were just happy with we getting to an All-Ireland quarter-final or All-Ireland semi-final, so I suppose you have to look at it and look at it. That's a good thing. The high demands are a sign of, uh, of success. For sure, and high demands never allow something like transition or a period of building to ever come into the thinking, but that's essentially what there is now in Kerry. I mean, there isn't an expectation from the county board to win an All-Ireland straight away, but as you well know, there's going to be an expectation, as I've seen for a stand in the terraces during the league campaign this year, to win every single match. And this transitional period that they've now entered into, which may provide more All-Ireland medals than we've ever seen, potentially, because they, this is the, the greatest set of minors football has potentially ever seen, there, there is just no room for manoeuvre over these next two years, is there? So there's going to be a high pressure on that to keep expectations in check. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose there will, but look, there's, there's no better... No better setup and no better county, in my opinion, to deal with that. You know, it's it's happened before throughout the years, and it'll no doubt happen again. You know, things go in in peaks and troughs. Not that it's a, a trough or anything at the moment, but like you say, when new faces come into a panel, it does take time in any sport, any team. It, it takes a bit of time to bet in, but um, like I, I think, in in my opinion, from what I saw of it, like because I was tied up with awfully a lot, I didn't see a whole lot of it. But mm. on the face of it, it, it seemed like a, a pretty good league campaign. By it, you know, a lot of new players looked at. Um, hold the Division 1 status, you know, that's, that's all you can ask for in, in a league campaign, really, when, when you look at so many new faces, really. I was reluctant to call you a retired goalkeeper there earlier on. Is it definitely over when it comes to Kerry for you? Uh, look, I'm, like I said, I, I, I took that decision last year and I'm happy where I'm at now, so I, I don't believe in the word retired in general anyway in any sure. walk of life, so, yeah. Um, so you've mentioned you, you're, you're happy with where you're at now, which is a bit awfully. And I guess it's an interesting place when you look at the, the fact that you're a goalkeeping coach now. And I, I guess, what age are you now? 32 years old at this point. And if you go back to where goalkeeping was at when you first got between the sticks, it's an art form that's developed hugely over that decade or two decades. Yeah, it's come on leaps and bounds. Like, and it's been brilliant, I think, um, because it used to frustrate me at times when I was younger where... The job of the goalkeeper was to watch the ball sailing over their head and put it down and pump it out 60 yards. And that was the role over and over again. So I think it's a great thing that the responsibility has increased on the goalkeeper. You know, um, They're an integral part of the team, if not the most integral part of the team, because that's where the majority of possession comes from in a game. So, and with the rules ever changing with kickouts and stuff like that. And, you know, it, the role, it's, it's evolved so much in the last years, but it's, it's been brilliant and it's something that... I've enjoyed and still do enjoy still playing, you know, evolving that role and, you know, taking on the, dif the different aspects of it. So, so what are you teaching or what are you helping to coach when you're in training in the inter-county setup? Is it mostly shot stopping or is it uh, more of a focus now on the kickouts? Yeah, it's a mixture. Like, I suppose the whole kickouts thing is, is a whole team thing. Like, that's not just mm. between the goalkeeper coach and the goalkeepers. Um, like, you have to have the whole team on that and coaches and management and everything. Um, yeah, then there's speci goalkeeper specific stuff, like kind of the more technical stuff, the, the shot stopping, the footwork, the high balls and stuff. So we focus a lot on that stuff, um, the kind of the, the nitty gritty of it, I suppose. And then you, you're going back into the whole team setup and doing whatever work on be kickouts or defensive structures, attacking structures, whatever it may be. Yeah. It must be, in a certain way, a little bit easier to be a goalkeeper in terms of a, the mental sense now, in terms of keeping yourself switched on, because as you mentioned there, they are now kind of part of the whole team dynamic. It's not so much pull the goalkeeper away to the side and put the goalkeeper and the sub-goalkeeper kicking the ball to each other for 10 minutes and leave them separate to the, to the conversation. They are a real part. It is a 1-15 to game now. Yeah, yeah, hugely so. And the goalkeeper has to be a good footballer now as well, mm. with the ball in hand, like you're seeing. And now there's goalkeepers who are like an extra attacker now in some, certain games. So that's another evolution of the position. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's vital to get the balance right between like having the specific goalkeeper work done and then obviously the, 
the, the football work with the rest of the team, you know, to have those skills up to scratch as well. Yeah, I can imagine. It's, so it's Wicklow this weekend. It's obviously a huge game in the context of where Offaly are hoping to go. It's one that a lot of people will be expecting you to win. Uh, I'm sure there's, there's always going to be pressure when you come from an Offaly team playing against Wicklow because obviously in terms of tradition, Offaly trumps Wicklow uh, pretty much every day of the week uh, with, uh, with no disrespect to Wicklow. I mean, do, do you still feel that in Offaly that it's been so long since there has been uh, a true All-Ireland contender but at the same sense there is that like idea of history around the place yeah like the there is a sense of tradition around the place um, and you can't buy that like you know tradition it, it gives a great platform to build on but at the same time tradition counts for nothing when you're there on a championship day and you know and the ball is being thrown in so it's it's something that can be used in the right way. All you have to do is you know you you walk into Kilcormac and you're seeing pictures of very very successful Offaly teams down through the years. Um, of course, the Seamus Derby picture is up there as well. But you look, that's fine too. Um, and yeah, so um, but but like I say, that tradition counts for nothing. Next Sunday, like you know, Wicklow aren't going to be talking about the, the tradition in Offaly or anything like that. Uh, we won't be either. The the game is there. There'll be nothing between the teams. So you know and. Just looking forward to, to the Leinster Championship game. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, just, just kind of on the last point then, it's the, the story that's kind of dominated the headlines from an awfully perspective this week has been the situation with Keen Johnson, that he's not going to play with the seniors. And if you had told me that player X isn't going to play for County Y because of this exact reason, I would have said, that's definitely Dublin or that's definitely Kerry because not that they don't need the player, but because they can afford to think about the future a little bit more. Like, it's quite long-sighted in a very good way by Offaly here. Is, would, would you agree with that? Yeah, I suppose. Look, it's it's something I've been very kind of adamant that my own role within the setup is is working with the goalkeepers, like, and I haven't been asking too many questions around or you know what else is going on within the setup. So it was kind of it was it was news to me as well. And look, the the most important thing is is Keane Johnson as the player at the middle of it all, like, mm. and what's what's best for him and and his development, and that's the decision that's been taken. And they're, they're the cards that we have to play with now and you know we, we have a panel of players there who's been training for, for a number of months now and that's what we take with us on Sunday and, and see where that takes us you know Yeah well I'm sure he's going to have a, a bright future in the Offaly jersey no matter what year he does eventually play uh, for the seniors 250 miles you understand Killarney to Kilcormark that's what you're commuting to do this gig yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, give or take a bit of traffic as well. That, yeah. That's pretty. We, we might look into this to see if that is the longest commute uh, that's currently uh, being done in the GA. Uh, Brendan Keeley, great to catch up. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. OTB AM. In association with Air. Get Air Sport free with Air Broadband.